Hey guys, what's going on? I, uh, I brought all my friends with me so we could preview the day. Now secretly, they, they all ditched me, so you just get me. But we're about to head into day three, quarterfinal day here at Star Series, where we're gonna join into this beautiful arena where it's gonna be filled with 18,000 people. We had some awesome matches so far. CyberZen even took a map off G2. That was impressive stuff, but ultimately they have uh, they've bowed out. They're gone, and Titan as well, unfortunately. They uh, kind of had the group of death. The non-reseeding of Envious joining in kind of made it hard for them. They did get a map off Fnatic, which was kind of impressive on Inferno, but overall we've got our usual suspects into uh, into the playoffs. So I think overall there's been some, some really interesting storylines. I think Fnatic looked a little bit sluggish starting out in this tournament, whether that had to do with, with uh, a little bit of rust from the holidays or maybe that the honeymoon period of Dennis is over. Um, but that said, they've, they've woken up throughout the tournament, which is very scary. Um, a lot of people have speculated that without the in-game leader, if they hit that kind of patch, how would they recover? Well, it turns out they just grind straight through it, go back to their raw skill, and uh, pull off crazy clutches on maps like Inferno against TSM, and all of a sudden they're right back at it. So I think they're still going to be a threat. And TSM, obviously, they were looked a little tired. Three best of threes today. Um, but uh, I, I think you can't rule them out as a threat ever. But right now, I'd say the team to beat. I mean, it's probably envious. The fact that they won four straight maps today on day two in, in Group B, killed Fnatic on, on even some of their best maps. Uh, Apex was lights out. Um, I, I think that's probably some of the best CS he's been playing in a while. Uh, and then Kenny, although he was hit or miss, still had some nuts off shots. I think they're in a really good place. It's, it's interesting as well, because NBK is calling for them now. So with NBK kind of taking the ropes, it frees up Happy a little bit, and he's still doing the lurking role. So that whole team, they're definitely looking to make changes, and, and the first step of it's really good. I mean, they brought in Maniac as a coach too, so over time, they're definitely gonna have some more analytical side to their game and, uh, and be a lot more tactical even than they are. Um, we won't see now going into the quarterfinals, obviously Envious, because they've made it straight through, or uh, Luminosity, which hopefully we get a chance to, uh, to see amazing gameplay out of them when we get to the semis again, because them taking down Na'Vi was a big monkey off their back winning that rivalry. But speaking of Na'Vi, they look really good. Um, obviously, them losing to Luminosity, like that was just due. But in the rest of the series, they've looked really solid. And playing in front of this 18,000 person arena in essentially their home region, now that we're in the arena, I, that's scary. Because the other teams have to put up with the crowd being against them every single time they play them. And it's TSM that has to play them first. I don't know if I'm supposed to make predictions right now, but I'd say if I did, I think Na'Vi might take down TSM in the quarter. That, that would be... That'd be a big feat, but it's entirely possible. I mean, they're the defending champions, after all, of, of Star Series. On the other side of that, G2, they woke up a little bit uh, in their game against Na'Vi, but even still, they came out a little shy, and, and they do go against the Awakened Fnatic. So I think that series favors Fnatic as well, which means we have an incredible-looking semifinals on, uh, on Saturday. And, I mean, I just can't wait. I'm excited. The whole arena, it's going to be packed. Maybe I'll actually have friends tomorrow when these seats are full, but... We'll, uh, we'll look forward to it. We'll see you then, guys. Thanks so much. Well, guys, welcome to it. It is day three, and we are in the arena. It looks beautiful out there. It's absolutely packed, and the crowd is as loud as you could imagine. We do get into the quarterfinals. And, of course, joining me on the desk to talk about our first matchup, we do have Duncan Thorne Shields, Yanko, and Henry Greer. Sorry, I can't say your last name, otherwise I would okay. try. But how are you guys doing today? Very well. We finally made it. It's coming in. The big games are in the stadium. It's looking absolutely electric out there. And uh, let's see if we can actually get some big performances from these teams. I've got a big, good feeling about today. Same. The, the, the place looks amazing for a Dota game. There, there's been a lot of cheering, and uh, yeah, I hope it continues for the Counter Strike games, even if we don't have as many CIS teams here. You know my feeling about Eastern European stadiums that fill to the brink in esports. So enough about that. I'm looking forward to seeing today whether Fnatic is actually going to be a team that can win the tournament. Because obviously, if they get stopped there by G2, that whole streak of we won every tournament with the that's over, and then we know the other teams who are here who are very dangerous teams to potentially win. 
So good tune-up match for Fnatic, I think, to see where they're at. G2, kind of on the outside, I think, after yesterday. It was so narrow that they even stayed in the tournament. And then later on is the match I think everyone's really looking forward to, which yep. will be the Na'Vi question mark game, which we've seen that match up a number of times. It's always good, even though in the past it's mainly been TQM taking the win. Yeah, I, I, I do look forward to that match as much just because I know you said not to talk about it, but this filled arena is going to be so, so into that Na'Vi team and just make sure that they're loud cheering. It's going to be pretty incredible to watch. Uh, we do have our schedule. We'll take a look at our bracket today as obviously the quarterfinals we've got two matches now keep in mind as well the two matches are separated so we've got the dota in there to give you a rough idea of the schedule eg just played vega they won two nothing but we've got fanatic g2 to start separated by the second dota game and then we go to question mark versus navi now this first one for anyone wondering why we did that by the way because actually I, I had some say in this like i think people often take for granted what a great game csgo is so i yeah. told them i like, put in like some little <laughs> pleb like Doto game or something that like those little scrubbers play. They like it around here, apparently. It's, the, it's a cultural <laughs> flavor, you know? I said, put that in, and then everyone will go, oh, I wish there was some brilliant CS on. There is, it's coming up next. Then we keep you waiting again, we tease you again Perfect. with the Doto, and then we come back into the CSGO. So everyone realizes what the true master race is. Keep it level, keep again, everyone. Again, master race is another one of my favorite topics there, Henry, so. Over to you, Sadikis. <laughs> well, we started strong. <laughs> we, have, we have started. Like, this is great. We've got That's our tempo set. The winner of this first game, G2 Fnatic, will move on to play Luminosity, the Na'Vi game. Oh, yeah. I'm looking we'll forward to on. seeing Fnatic Luminosity. That'll be a really great series. Yeah, me too, actually. Yeah, I agree. I don't uh, disagree at all. I don't know how the rest of you guys feel about it. Uh, let's, let's roughly talk about it. We've already seen the maps. Obviously, we're going to jump away in a second, and we'll come back and get into more detail. But initial thoughts on the yeah. two quarterfinals today. Obviously, you've made your slight prediction known. Yeah, well, I mean, since we actually know the maps here, this is kind of, I mean, this is an absolute suicide mission for G2, I have to say. If they got to Dust 2, okay, they actually haven't been very good in Dust 2 recently, but at least they'd have something of a chance. What I don't really understand in terms of this pick ban is how G2 arrived at a scenario where, for me, they've got two of Fnatic's top three maps as the first two maps in the series. So this is really looking like, just from what G2's done in terms of the pick ban, like we're heading towards a 2-0. And forget the maps, we already know Fnatic's a superior team to G2, so they're really going to be up against it today. I, I just want to clarify quickly before I get your thoughts, Yanko. Cash will be first. I know the graphic doesn't indicate that, but they had first pick, so yeah. That'll, yeah. that'll be first, then Inferno. Uh, yeah, but I feel the G2 have a problem in this particular matchup is that, that they simply have maps that they do not play, like Overpass and Cobble, as we can see here, the maps they veto, then the maps they do play, Fnatic also plays them, and Fnatic is obviously the, the better team here, and G2 kind of plays train here and there, and that's a that's a ban for Fnatic as well. So they were definitely in a you know in a weaker position coming into the map veto. But the the thing here is as well that similar to the Navi Luminosity matchup is this one. Just that the both teams have a similar play style, more more of a loose play style, puggy play style. But the problem is that Fnatic is so much better at that <coughs> play style than G2 is, and their players are you know, more skilled as well. They have more firepower. So I, I really don't see this going uh, G2's way at all. Yeah, the, the thing that worries me about just the opening map, at least, is Cash. That's one of the few maps G2's actually won this week, and that was against uh, CyberZen. But the scoreline was still 16-14 going yep. to that one. It hasn't been so much like a case of, oh, we can say oh, G2 are normally strong on these maps, etc. They've actually just had a really poor showing throughout this tournament. The players haven't turned up. The big names we normally expect to be, like, lighting up the scoreboard. Rain, especially, he's been one of the lowest performers for the team. Um, that's something you don't normally say too often. You're one of the, with the big names actually putting out the big performances. So just to kick things off on cash, I, I'm really worried for G2. I think this may be the end of their run here, but uh, who knows? Maybe they, they've had a couple of days to warm up now. This is the one they really need to step up. We need to see players like Michael Ely and Fox especially. He's the AWP player now. He's like actually been stepping up in previous tournaments, especially at the major. His AWP play was actually on par with some of the with better orpers in the world. So if he can step up and Rain can find some form, maybe we'll have a decent game, but I don't see this being anything but a 2-0 right now. Yeah, yeah. And, and you touched on it as well, just quickly, <coughs> Yanko, and you can follow it up, Thorne. They're both pug styles. They're not known for in-game leadership right now without Pronax. So you're, you're only as good as your five individual skilled players. Flush has been struggling for Fnatic, but there's been more True. struggles right now for yeah. G2. But it's not a problem, I mean, for... Fnatic, if Flasha is struggling, but he's doing a good job in-game leading, you know, if his team is winning, that is, it's not such, such a huge problem. And uh, Fnatic have been on the rise of in form from yesterday, from the first game up to the last game. But uh, on the side of G2, Rain was one of the most, uh, you know, in my eyes, he was one of those stable players, a player you can rely on always to get a kill or two defending a bomb site. He would have games that he would, that he would play extremely well, but you could always rely on him. And now when he took up the in-game leading role, you know, he has 
been playing worse, I mean, obviously. And he also had just a, he was on a vacation before this tournament, only has a couple of hours in CSGO recently, so it's definitely well, a, a big problem. This is what the interesting thing, I think we touched on this in the first day, that uh, G2 are actually one of the teams that heralded the in-game leader being the coach, and now they don't even have a coach here at the event, and they've put it on the, the, the pressure onto one of their biggest fraggers and most explosive players. Now he's the one, I think in an interview recently, he even said, I, I'm just doing it because no one else is actually capable right now. So obviously, when they had Dennis, I think they had that a tactical insight to kind of help them out, but now it just seems like they're actually... Uh, d disabling themselves a little bit by putting that pressure on towards Rain. I, uh, I really don't like this move either because, as as you kind of referenced there, Yanko, Rain was the stable player. You look at the rest of them. One of the things about being like aimers and pug players is usually you're a bit up and down. All right. Well, we're gonna we'll come back to this. We're gonna throw to the stage for the opening ceremony, guys. Добрый день, Минск Арена, здравствуйте! В очередной раз мы приветствуем всех тех, кто пришел на этот невероятный стадион. И говорим спасибо каждому зрителю, который делает киберспорт лучше и больше. Спасибо каждому из вас, кто пришел сюда и кто смотрит нас с помощью платформы Twitch. Здравствуйте еще раз! Сегодня здесь, на этой сцене, сыграют, не побоюсь этого слова, лучшие команды мира. Давайте встретим первые две из них. Итак, справа от вас легендарная команда Fnatic. И несмотря на то, что им не удалось выйти из группы с первого места, это еще ни о чем не говорит. Слева от вас команда Gamers 2. Сильный коллектив, который постарается что-то противопоставить шведам. Сегодня в рамках дисциплины Counter-Strike Global Offensive нас ждет две игры. И напомню, что во второй игре будет участвовать, пожалуй, ну, самая любимая СНГ-команда. Это команда Natus Winsor, но чуть позже, чуть позже мы об этом поговорим. Что же мы будем делать сейчас? Кто готов болеть? Кто готов реагировать на каждый хедшот? Ну что ж, давайте сделаем все возможное, что зависит от нас, чтобы команды чувствовали, что здесь есть те самые люди, которых можно назвать болельщиками. Потому что никакой спорт невозможен без болельщиков. Поэтому спасибо вам еще раз. Передаем слово аналитике. Мы в Минск арене. Right, guys, I think the scale of that stage is absolutely insane. Unfortunately, we had no idea what was being said. And no, no, I, actually, to be. I, that, I, I'm, I'm used to this, right? You normally in Counter Strike, there's always someone just going on in Russian, and you're just going, "When's this gonna end? Can we get on with the Counter Strike, please?" <laughs> Ma well, that's matchmaking right there at its yeah, finest. That, that was a joke, actually. But something for wrong with. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's here as like subtitles for people who not only can't hear but don't understand basic concepts, you know. So. <laughs> something okay. wrong with that flag on Fnatic's side as well. 
Yeah, well, it it left over from the Dota team yeah, because they're Malaysian, so. but yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. can't have everything. C coming back to the Already analysis cool. part. Let's do that. Being the professional Let's here, you know, right boys. Now. So yeah. what you mentioned about leadership as well, I think that people underestimate not only in-game leadership, but also having true leadership within the team. You know, when you when you that's what the mo what's the most important when things start going south. You know, when it, when it's rough, you need to have someone who has who, in which in who his teammates have confidence. You know, who, someone who's gonna make a call and gonna say, okay, guys, things aren't going well. Let's now do this and this and this, and people are gonna believe that that's gonna work. And that's how you can start and making a comeback and everything. I feel that that's the problem with the maybe even with the fanatic lineup, definitely with the G2 lineup, and also maybe if you wanna. You know, broaden it also the the new Cloud9 team. Even you can have a lot of talent; that's not a problem. But you need to have someone who's gonna, you know, take over the reign and, and who's gonna be the leader in that team. If take you remember when this G2 team, when they were called Kingwin, was first formed, yep. they so they they put all the stress on the idea that they were friends. That's what it was all about. The only reason they did that initially is because they were losing. So you had to have it as something. There's got to be something good about the team. Now that they're winning. You saw when Scream left the team, he said like the communication wasn't very good, went like that. I look at this team, I don't think this is a real team in terms of like leadership and we really like believe this is a long-term project. For me, it really is like a, a, a hired gang of mercenaries. They, they've been hired for the top dollar. That's the reason why AZ joined, because he was in a bad circumstance before, he can get more money, get potentially have a, a, a better players around him to win. I don't think this is like a team that in two years from now will be like, oh, remember the great synergy they had and how they played in that way. So as a result, when it comes to what you're saying here, when you're down and out and when things aren't going well and when you only have three maps you can play and you're in a tournament where someone can ban two, it's not going to be a good state of affairs for you and you're not going to be the team that's like plucky and fights back into it. So I, I see this as like, uh, this is going to be a very one-sided matchup, I think. Do you doubt the longevity of this team potentially with all that said? I think it's almost certain because, I mean, you look at the team, some of these players really are just waiting until the chance comes to join the right team. If, if AZ got that offer from TQM, he'd be out the door well, immediately. Yeah, obviously, Dennis did leave, but obviously yeah. the, the offer coming in for Fnatic, I think that's an anomaly in some circumstances. I, I think the team does have longevity. It's obvious that it can work to some sort of level at the uh, conclusion of poker. I think that was quite obvious what the team is capable of. Obviously, the lineup's changed a little bit since then. We've had AZ coming in for Dennis. But when Jacob first joined it, they actually seemed like they had hit that honeymoon period and actually got to some sort of level that was actually very impressive. And they're taking down some big scalps there. But ever since AZ joined, it hasn't had that same sort of effect, hasn't hit the same sort of dizzy heights yet. Hopefully, like 2016 is going to be their year, but they need to start putting in a lot more work. Every single time, it's always like, oh, I haven't played enough, I've been on holidays and stuff. If you want to be taken seriously and make this much money, I think you need to be uh, well, committing to these sort of that's events. That's a lame excuse, isn't I know, it? Well, especially when you know the salary that these sorts of guys are making. Yeah. The idea that, like, oh, I had three weeks off. Well, okay, mate, uh, what job in the world do you just take three weeks off, then two months later you take them all off? If you want to be off? the best and get paid as much money, it's, you need to be It's not a good answers. excuse. Let's talk about the easy aspect mm -hmm. as well, because by now, in theory, with the amount of time he's had, he should be well adapted into the team. This tournament has had good results, but he's kind of the only one that's punching at that level. Yeah, literally. I think uh, just looking statistically, like we said, Rain's at the bottom of the pile. He's actually got Fox above him as well. Rain is someone for me that really should be up there. Like, Makaleli, sometimes a little bit inconsistent, but uh, Rain, like, he's like, He's, he's so reliable, like you said before. He can be left towards bomb sites by himself, always reliable for one or two frags. Just hasn't been putting out those numbers. And when you have someone like that, that's normally anchoring certain positions, he's dying without any kills. That's going to be a reason why you lose these key games. Mm -hmm. I think Makaleli particularly has been very underwhelming for me. Rain, I can understand a bit because he's having to do this in game leader aspect. Mm. I haven't seen anything from Makaleli in a while now. I mean, okay, Jacob had like a series, he was all right. Obviously, AZ was very good in the first series. But Makaleli, if you remember, is supposed to be the guy where. It was at Clujna Poco. He's the only reason they got past Mouse Sports. He it's had that crazy though, first yeah. game where he went 30 plus. He was on Mirage. He was absolutely carrying. We haven't seen anything like that from him, this guy, in a while. And obviously, he's the face of the team, you know. He's the guy, he's like the talismanic guy that you want to see doing well. That seemed to start when he switched with Fox and let Fox go back to the main op. Originally, Fox was getting the hate. Is that some sort of problem within the team of not utilizing that fifth player correctly? Well, it, it might be. I think that Fox is more comfortable with the op, and I think that he's doing a better job. Like The, the thing is, with an opper, my, my opinion is, like, Michael L is one of those uh, players that he can go crazy with the op in a certain round, you know, get that triple kill, yeah. quad kill, but you can also see him maybe miss some easy shots, you know, and for me, the, the, the point of the opera is to utilize the strength of the gun, right? I mean, so you want your opera to, to 
hit the shots that he's supposed to hit. You know, you want that more than you want him to maybe miss miss those shots here and there, but then go crazy. Yeah. You know, in in some rounds. Yeah, Michael Ellie's definitely that flashy or per play style, which yeah. is can be unreliable at times. I think Fox throughout 1.6 and the source as well. He was always known as an AWP player. That's where he feels more comfortable. He's kind of shunned into that support player role. But I agree with Yanko. I think him coming in as the more stable AWP player, someone who's like you just know his bread and butter is just hitting standard shots, not doing anything too crazy. And Michael Eddy, I think, is a very strong rifle as well. He proved himself at Clues and Poker, but uh, this tournament been very quiet indeed. And it's, I think they're still trying to find and perfect this recipe for how they're going to approach games going forward. Is there not room for a potential double op setup as well? Yeah, definitely. Like I Michael think Eddie that's, crazy. that's always a, an option for them. Obviously, we know Michael Eddie is strong with AWP as well. I think you always have to have that double op set up in your back pocket when it's needed. If things aren't working, it's always a good um, fallback strategy to fall, go back onto. But um, yeah, this, this game's going to be a true test for them, obviously, against Na Navi yesterday. It's a game that didn't have so much importance, so it's difficult to take away too much from it. They got them to overtime and then a 16-14 as well. So some signs of life, at least, that they're actually warming up and getting into this tournament properly. But obviously, today is the one that really matters. The thing is, though, you're not going to be getting double op setups in this game because we know Fnatic's going to permanently force by. So you're not going to have the economy do it unless you're, you're rolling them completely. The big issue I see here is it feels like because on stream we saw the Envious game and they were dominant over Fnatic, it feels like you want to go, oh, but Fnatic isn't doing that well. Fnatic still was dynamite when they played against TQM. They yeah. weren't terrible against the Envious guys. They, had, they were in some of those maps at times. So for me, there's a, there's a tear between these two teams at the moment. As much as you want to believe the guys from G2 can get to the level they were at Occlusion Apoca, they, they haven't shown that for me that they're ready to step up to that, like top four team I status. I, I don't think of this event especially. I think like in a couple of months' time when they've got fully out of the holiday period, I guess, and actually starting to put the hours in, we can see them bounce back. But the form I've seen right now for some of the key players, I just I don't see it happening. And this probably is the end of the run. But let's, who knows? Let's switch pages well mm -hmm. a little bit into into more of that fanatic. Sure. I guess tournament we've seen. Obviously, some of the statistics we're seeing on screen include the the online portion, so they're not 100% accurate. Olaf as well has been a little bit slow, and Crims is someone that I haven't seen the reliability from. He's normally the stable player of Fnatic. I mean, he had a good series yesterday. I think that was the one against, who would it have been? Titan, I mean, the lower bracket one. Yeah, he yeah. was pretty good in that That's one. That's right, yeah. Um, it's true. I mean, him and Olaf, Olaf particularly, I thought, played very poorly in the series against Envious. It's very rare you'll ever see him play two whole maps like that. So, yeah, I mean, you have to wonder at the moment whether Fnatic guys are out. But the problem is when it's a really high-level matchup like that, like Envious, TSM, uh, Envious, Fnatic, these, these teams that have played each other many times and usually they're deciding titles, I always think of those ones. They're like game within a game because it's, then it's all like, what have we been practicing against each other? What did we do last time? It's not as much just like the teams, where are we at right now and how good are we? It, there's always some extra little detail that they're throwing in for each other. So when you come down to a team like this, this is supposed to be Fnatic against the rest of the field. Yep. So now I expect a standard Fnatic performance. They've got the maps they want. They'll play normally. I expect all of my will be good. Crims will be solid. I think it's just going to be a Fnatic 2-0. But the thing is, you look at the Fnatic team and you say Olof hasn't been performing yesterday. Crims so so Flasha as well. But that team has so much... But you know, so much star power in their team. You had JW playing well yesterday throughout the day, more or less. Dennis as well. So you know, you only need a couple of those players to step up in order for them to be able to win a, a series, even. And if all of them play well as they have been more or less in the past tournaments, then you can <laughs> get those titles, win those championships as well. Even though they didn't have as much time to practice, their map, map pool isn't as, as deep as they would like to, probably. And actually, one more thing I wanted to say as well. As Henry pointed out before, part of the reason why we've ended up with these maps, firstly, because it's a ban-ban system, but also because we know that the guys from G2 aren't going to play Cobblestone. They aren't going to mm -hmm. play over. you got to look at it. And they've barely played them at all, yep. like never with these lineups. So. That's another thing that, I'm sorry, that excuse doesn't fly now. You can't have a pro team for months and months and just have like three maps that you can play. That, that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's a huge problem. The other side of that, Fnatic's banned out Mirage in this. That some in the past has been one of their go-tos. Yeah. With this new lineup, and this weekend has highlighted it more than any other as we look back at the veto, they've been struggling on some of their comfortable oh, maps. Yeah. Is this sort of a shift they've in game style with the new lineup? I'm not sure. Like They've played Mirage twice this tournament, actually. They played against TQM, lost that game. It was 16-8. Uh, they also played against Envious, now 16-8 as well. So potentially, I think like in the past, it's been a very strong map for them going forward. But this event, maybe they're struggling a little bit. The approach with uh, Flusher calling now, maybe that's having some impact, and he's not really got his head into that round. He hasn't got the same experience Pronax had on that map, potentially. But uh, I, I, I think that's fair enough. Like, if they want to, it's a map he doesn't feel particularly comfortable on, and it could be a risk for them. Why just, just play the solid maps? We know they can play Cash. Like, especially Cash, that used to be like Olaf's playground. This is the map he used to get godlike status on. He used to get like 20 to 0 on that map. So if he turns up, that could be a very interesting prospect for them indeed. Yeah. Mirage was a very strong map for Fnatic coming into this tournament. It was actually statistically their best map on land with the new 
starting lineup. But it doesn't, uh, when you consider the two losses, admittedly, the THQM one's not that bad. They are very good on that, man. It's Envious was the shock. We didn't know Envious was that good on it. Then again, Envious the whole day were a shock. They were, I think they were surprised yeah. themselves how well they were. So for me, it's just, this is actually going back a little bit to the old Fnatic pan, ban system, which is since they always had a deep map pool, they were the team that never went with like, this is our map, we always play this. They always went, right, even if that's a good map, if it's, the opponent, if it's good for the opponent, ban it out. Play something that we're good on, but the opponent isn't good. They always went for that route. And that's why they could always, to me, that's why they had so many wins and so many championships, because they always were getting slight edges in those yeah. pit ban vetoes. Whereas some teams like Envious, in fact, both the Envious lineups, sometimes they would be stubborn and they go, oh, Cloud9, your two best maps are Cash and Dust2. Oh, they're ours as well. Let's just play. We've got a video about Fnatic. We'll take a peek at that and then continue the discussion in a moment. It's the first event of the year. All right, I apologize. The good news is we can continue the discussion. Right it is away. the first event of the year, though. He's right. So <laughs> that's all we need to know. <laughs> and over to Crims for the next piece of update. So. <laughs> um, I want to make a point just to further that as well on Mirage. CT side's one of the issues. Now, I'm going to kind of preface this a little bit. You would think with a new in game leader, T side would be harder. That's where the execution, the timings come in, sure. and that with experienced, skilled players, know how to play your position, CT. Why is it that CT's been so hard for them, Yanko? Well, okay. <laughs> do you, do you, want, do you want to go ahead? I just have a little detail throw in there. So in an interview I did with JW recently, he actually told me that when they're on T-sides, their team never tried to be super tactical and have like really yeah. set things that would always... He said all they tried to do was just be like comfortable because they thought like natural chemistry is what would get... is what would allow them to work, would allow all of us to go do what they wanted to do. And so supposedly towards the end of that era when they were like... They weren't really feeling Pronax's style as much. The reason they wanted Flush as the in-game leader is because people like all of thought, right, well, Flush is the in-game leader, I kind of get to do what I want on T-side. So in a weird way, I understand intuitively what you're saying is correct there, but I think for Fnatic particularly, they want to play a little bit more free-for-all on T-side anyway. So that's why at the moment, with our good players, it can work, but maybe CT setups are what they don't have. And f f famously, Products was very good at making the read on CT side of whether which man to like swap over of the, of the guy who's the hybrid, the guy who's the go between the two sites. He'd always be good at drawing that guy over famously on Inferno. So I think maybe that's where they lost something when they lost Products. Yeah. And it's not just that, it's also that when you play CT against teams like TSM, Navi, those teams are very structured, you know, they, they have a set plan that they want to execute and they're really thorough and they know what, what positions are covered on what other spots they should focus on and you need to be on the city side, you need to be mobile, you need to react to what your opponent is doing. If you, for example, m one of the most common examples is Mirage, a lot of teams go for mid control and if you're a city and you let them take that mid control and you don't react anywhere on the map, you don't try to clear maybe A apps, B apps, slope, whatever, so that, that can be problematic for you, then you can get, you know, pinched into the side from three sides and, and lose around. And I feel that that maybe has been the problem. You need to have someone who's going to make that call in the, in the team. I, I feel like, uh, especially on the CT side, in the, the biggest note to take away from the Envious game was the Force Pies. When the players aren't performing at the 100% level that we're used to and they haven't got the skill to actually take these kills down, the Force Pies with the, the Mag 7s, the Scouts, even the 5 7s and stuff like that, it's just, it gets to the point where they don't even have the money to actually make these rounds effective for them. The CT economy on maps like Mirage, we need the AWP potentially two of them sometimes. It can be a very difficult map that can run away from you. You can find yourself in the rut. When Fnatic are on like 100% form, those force flies work out for them like a lot of the times and it's actually like very impressive to watch. But when they're in the, the slump they were on the first day, especially they're just turning up, warming up to the event, I feel like that was a, a key reason as to why they were losing a lot of the rounds. I've Mirage. never understood that logic as well. Even top level pro teams will get into this thinking mm -hmm. where they're not winning on their full buy rounds. Yeah. So then they're like, right, let's force it up. It's like, if you can't win with the full weapons and all your normal setups, you're not probably going to win these rounds when you have lesser guns against the full weapons. Now, it, it, here's the thing. If you're in incredible form and you just happen to lose a round, it wasn't that you played badly. Now you're an incredible team. You've got Envious. You've got Fnatic. Okay, give your great aimers who are on fire. Give yeah. them a, a whatever weapon you can get. They'll get you back in the game at that point. I always say this. If you're, if you're playing badly and you force by, you just accelerate how fast you lose the game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think, this is, I think this is the problem that a lot of players, teams, in-game leaders sometimes tunnel vision into that economy system, you know. People force by most of the times because they want to reset the opponent's economy because that means if you manage to put pressure on their economy, then you will get a couple of free runs for yourself. Your economy will be more strong. It will allow you for more room for, for mistakes as well. If you lose a round, you can buy up again 
fully with, with all of your resources, but you, I agree that sometimes you should just say, okay, guys, we have these advantages as a team. Maybe, you know, you most common example what is, what, oh, sorry, finish your point. is like with opers, you know, like you have Guardian, but you keep forcing and you don't let him have an op. So mm -hmm. sometimes you just need to say, okay, guys, the, the beginning of this half didn't go our way. We lost the first four or five rounds, but let's not lose another four because we keep force buying yeah. and, and wasting uh, time. One of the most frustrating things for me when watching the high-level CS, Matt, we've noticed a lot recently, when, it, when a team gets like a, a huge advantage in the first half, let's say they win 11-4 in the first yeah. half of Inferno, for example, they, they lose the pistol in the second half, and then they're forced by in the second round, and on their CT side as well, they're just like stifling themselves from going forward. They lose that, then they go into the first gun round, and they don't even have enough money for kits, they don't have enough for AWP, or even key utility like smoke grenades and incendiaries, and that's when the rut begins, that's when you actually start rotting away because you keep force buying every situation and that's how you can let a game run away from you. It seems like sometimes they need to just kind of calculate what's the biggest percentage chance of actually winning the game here. Look at yeah. the bigger picture instead of trying to end it as quickly as possible. Yeah, to take, take the lesser loss rather yeah. than prolong the inevitable. Take the three rounds potentially instead of the five in that yeah. case. I mean, it also suggests when you do it, obviously this isn't always the case because like we're saying, sometimes they tunnel on it, but it also, as a, as a more macro view on it, suggests that you're actually not that confident in your executes. Like really, if you think that your rounds work when you have the weapons, it doesn't matter if you eco now, because you know as soon as you get the full weapons, you in theory then will win all the rounds and win the game. So it's just a higher percentage you, chance of winning. If you really yeah. have that confidence in your standard play, yeah. do it. I understand in the past why Envious was so much better, because they had always had the most skill, and this was just their style. They really were that yeah. puggish style team. And we saw yesterday it still works for them. That's, that's sure, the reason but I mean if you are like a TQM or a Fnatic, you're supposed to, yeah, you can have a bit of that, but you, you need to really understand that if you have the tactics and you have the set style of play, your default style is what's going to win you the game, not these janky buys of like an SMG for this guy and this guy with head, head armor, but just a P250. Yeah. Th these aren't going to be high quality buys for you. And another, and another reason why, why people, I think, uh, would force so much because they thought people are a bit... Uh, afraid, thinking that if we let this, for example, on Inferno cities, if we let them have a good economy going, that you will never be able to get to a site because of the smokes, molotovs, flashes and everything. So that's why you force, so you you never allow them to, to get their economy going. But now even more so with the new round times and everything, people should maybe, you know, force buy less in my, in my opinion. Yeah, that, that, so that is a perfect segue to the next topic. The new round time. Now, I personally, and I, I want your, all of your feedback on both sides sure. of it, I'm okay with the extra 10 seconds on the round because it actually puts more emphasis on tactics, which I think some teams could benefit from. I'm not sold on the five seconds on the bomb. Yesterday we saw it on Inferno, Fnatic versus TQM. There was three or four rounds that they should not have won if not for that extra five seconds. I'm normally up for changing games normally. Like, I think it keeps it interesting, especially in other esports. You see like an update like this put into it, it adjusts the way the game has to be played. I think it can, in the future, especially this year, we'll see it uh, adapt the CT setups especially. I think it allows you to take a little bit more risks and you can actually start stacking bomb sides more heavily. So let's say you're playing cash, for example, and you feel like it's a very B-heavy team or execute based. You can start stacking players towards B, expecting those, uh, uh, those plays to be coming in. And it makes retakes a lot more viable this time. So I think it makes uh, the approach to the game going forward this year a lot more interesting. It kind of can add that sort of dynamic. That the fact you don't even have to buy a kit now, potentially on pistol, it could actually change some of the approaches you go with it. I think we saw Luminosity especially. They're actually on their, their, their CT pistol round on train. They're actually changing their ideas a little bit. They're actually focusing more on HG grenades and playing one player towards the inside bomb site. Everyone else is stacked towards the outside. And you rotate back in with those HG grenades and you just put that airstrike onto the bomb site when they're trying to plant the bomb. It's kind of a, a different mentality. You know, you have that extra five seconds. You can. Uh, afford to have people rotate over and then retake with utility instead of having to expend everything on uh, like kits and stuff. Mm -hmm. I That's also feel that I also feel that maybe the thought process behind it is that of course you extend the round time so that it's not as CT sided but when there's more time for the T's that also gives them more opp opportunities to fake a site. So if, if the cities are out of resources and something's going on that the T's are executing they're they're forced to rotate at that point. So uh, and if they wrote it, if it's a fake, then the extra five seconds on the diffuse gives them time to come back to the site and still, you know, have a have an equal chance of, of winning the round at that point. So, I, I so think you think it. the bomb is is increased to make it out of necessity? Yeah, for the because fact that the if it were if it were only the round time and not the diffuse time, then it would be maybe uh, more to the T's favor than than it should be. The problem is I, I just don't like the premise because we're having to accept this premise that the smoke is never going to be fixed. Therefore, we're going to make the time different. We're going to make the bomb different. The problem with this is anyone who watched Count Strike 1.6, so the map we're always referencing is Inferno mm -hmm. because in CSGO, that's where the smokes come one after the other into the banana. You can never push up there. In CS 1.6, where we had the same round time as we used to have in, in uh, CSGO now, 
there was never a problem with the amount of time because the smoke wasn't overpowered. And so as a result, on that map, even with that amount of time, you could repeatedly probe both sites, wait until he'd drawn a man over. Famously, Mouse Sports MTW used to be very good at this on the T side. And the whole game was to just make one of the sites be tricked into rotating the guy over and then you would hit the other side. And that's all you'd do with the first minute of the round. That can't exist in CSGO because there's a smoke in your face at the beginning. Be so you're waiting and basically you only have 30 seconds to do that in at the end. So it's true. In CSGO, you can't rotate between the two sides because you'd be really cutting it thin. And you sometimes do see those crazy calls, but they're, they're really like out of left field. And, and it relies more on getting the first pick more than just simply but baiting we, someone out. But we can solve this whole problem by just making the smoke last slightly it's, less amount of time. Is it so much of a problem now though? T-Sides of Inferno, in the last couple of months at least, they They've been actually been proving that a lot of top teams can win those halves quite convincingly. It doesn't feel like Inferno is like the broken map it once was a couple of years ago. Actually, it's getting to the point now, Envious are getting like to double figures on the, the T sides of Inferno. So, is it so much the approach that these certain teams are actually taking, and people are kind of still complaining about this smoke situation? I I think it comes down more to the approach of the teams. I, I never so. felt I never felt that smokes were overpowered in a way. I think that it was just a problem of maybe the. Uh, people playing T side weren't creative enough, you know, to either bait out those smokes or to. This, this is why Nuke was so good originally. I think, yeah. like, if people say it's a really bad map, but I actually like that approach. Yeah. It was so CD sided that you could actually be a lot more creative with your strategy. You had to work harder for it. Let me, let me further your point, though. You've got longer smokes, and now you also have Molotovs in comparison mm -hmm. to 1.6. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. So that you have these two aspects where, listen, I like both of them as core concepts. Like the Molotov did eventually prove to be a good addition. It had an, a an aspect to it. Mm -hmm. But the idea is, as I said, it's a, it's a problem I always bring up whenever Valve does something in the game. They always do it, and it seems like if they think about it, they only did it in isolation. So if they talk about a smoke, I bet they'd never even bring up a Molotov. They'd go, right, well, smoke, do this, this. No, the problem is, what if I have a smoke? I throw that, then I wait, then I throw a Molotov. Now I wait, now I throw a smoke. And now I have 10 of them on these teams. Well, I wouldn't have 10, obviously. But now I have like five, and then I have 10 of the smokes. So in this scenario, this is the big problem overall, is that when you combine the two things, and it doesn't happen as much. Henry's right, actually. People do win more T-side rounds on Inferno, but that classic problem that everyone did run into, where the meta was simply everyone does this on CT side, that actually limits strategy because everyone does it. But so we didn't have enough time for the T's to execute. But the thing here is, why, why did it become so stale, so CT side, nothing's happening? Because people started doing what Tamvias probably started doing first, throwing a lot of smokes towards B, even from A. The you banana, can throw yeah. a smoke from long towards the B side, so they could you know, only have maybe even MBK alone there towards the end of the round and he would always have that area smoked off but that is exploitable if you keep throwing smokes towards B that means there's going to be less smokes for the A side players to defend and you can see yesterday in, in that particular series TQM against Tenvias TQM were able to win a couple of uh, gun rounds on their T side by going A with, with their smokes, flashes, and everything, and they would win those rounds. It's very it's cluttered, though. I mean, is that still viable in the sense that you've got the graveyard fences, you've got so many angles and pit? I, I mean, but considering all the resources you have as T, you can smoke off, you know, parts parts of the map. You can use your flashes as well. I'm not saying it's easy, I'm, I'm a, but I'm saying, as I said yesterday, I think that if you're T and you know the setup of the cities, I think that's exploitable because that, you know, uh, wrap around the A site is pretty powerful if you do it correctly. The, the, the problem is when they have all of their resources, when they have smokes and molotovs and flashes, that's when it's really hard to, to, you know, to get into A site. Plus, you have to remember as well, that era we're talking about when LDLC and Fnatic were doing the CT side style, yeah. that was actually when almost no one used molotovs. So, for example, if you want to hit the A site, Amazingly, I still don't know how it's possible to this day. People never used to actually Molotov into the cobby, even though LDLC would have someone there like 90% of the time. Instead, they'd try and just manually check it. So you'd think actually, because what's funny is when people did use Molotov, it was only to go into B to smoke off those OB out, spots. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. There, it is true to some degree. Essentially, what we're, what we're saying here is, the problem with the meta game is players themselves buy into the concept. Oh, that's just how you have to play the game. And then they just only do that. And they don't uh, themselves think outside the box. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Consensus on the round timer is it's actually the smokes that's still the issue, but let, what about the bomb itself on retakes? Now, if teams can save some utilities, makes the retake harder, you know, it almost like puts up as the T's have to, whereas the CT's, now you've got two cracks at it. We saw it yesterday. Device kills someone defusing, they still have the time. It's the same point as Duncan said, like with the smokes. Why just not make the defuse kit $200 instead of 400 I mean, yeah. I don't know why, why it was changed initially, but you, you don't have to increase the round time. Uh, the bomb time just make uh, defuse kits more accessible to the CT's. I mean, you know, you, in my opinion, I understand what they're trying to do. I, I just think there's a much simpler way to, to do it. 
Mm -hmm. Interesting stuff. Uh, let's get into a little bit of the nitty gritty. Let's st let's start predictions on the end with you, Henry. Sure. You can elaborate as much as um, you'd like. Oh, we got we got time. We've we? got some time. Um, it's going to be interesting. I think today this is one. This is a big stage time. This is what Olaf's bread and butter. I think he will have a resurgence from the last couple of days. He's had pretty lackluster performance so far. I think Cash is a great place for him to start, and uh, it's going to be. A, the series is panned out so far. It's looking like it's going to be a 2-0 Fnatic. I think that's the only real way this is going to be a realistic outcome here. Hopefully, we'll see G2 have a decent crack at it. But from what I've seen from them so far, they look like they're in a more of a disarray than Fnatic are. They had a difficult series versus CyberZen. Some very close games there. And they, they were the, the team we expected just to be completely flushed out in the beginning of the tournament. They actually went 2-1 one of them. And Cash was a 16-14 experience for them. So, um, if, so an actual prediction in terms of numbers, I'd say I can't see anything else apart from 2-0 just because... If, especially if Fnatic could, like steamroll them on cash, I think that's going to be. I, I don't see these guys having the mental fortitude to actually carry on and get past that. I have to agree with with Henry here, considering that both teams have this, a similar play style, and Fnatic is just better at it. These are uh, maps that Fnatic is good on as well. They have been on a rise of form from the beginning of this tournament. So yeah, two zero for Fnatic. Yeah, I'm going to go 2-0 Fnatic. The thing is, Inferno is a phenomenal map for Fnatic. It's always been like what built the team, you know, what they made the dynasty. And, and part of the reason why is because we know Crimson and Olaf Meister, that combo on that map is especially, yeah. especially good. Now, you might look at yesterday and go, oh, well, Envious kind of toyed with them. Envious when Apex is going crazy on T-side yeah. is a very different animal to even Envious on any other day. So I don't put too much stock in that. They're a fantastic Inferno team. When you go over to Cash, G2's pick, they do have a chance here. Well, we start, to be fair, we start on Cash. Just oh, we start on Cash. Yeah. Okay, so we'll, when we're on Cash, rather. This is one that GU has a chance on, certainly. This was the one they even were able to beat TSM on when they were IM San Jose. They're a decent team on this map. The problem is, I think actually this is like a sleeper for Fnatic. The thing at the moment with Cash is, no one wants to play envious on cash no one wants to play for nothing cash because it's become the map that they're just so phenomenally good at it's a bit like the old cobblestone people only ever play the team on it if they're also good on it so as a result they don't get to play it that much therefore people haven't seen that they're this amazing on it so i think when you see a good cash team like g2 go up against fanatic and fanatic really do beat them handedly you'll see that this is this is another map that they have the whole time it's just other teams won't let them play it what, one key thing i think is going to be a big part of this obviously we talked about the coaches before fanatic have got vago behind them kind of helping them out you're on the big stage now you've got 18,000 people looking on you that's just added pressure going forward rain's not been able to i want to clarify it's an 18,000 capacity arena we're using an 8,000 seat configuration just so people oh, know at home okay well that's kind of that's kind of ruined it now man. <laughs> i'm sorry it was, i was all excited for this now. Kind of <laughs> anyway uh yeah so obviously i'm just saying that the point i'm trying to make is obviously that's that added pressure in the booth it's been raised from being in the little studio kind of like just one camera on you to all these people looking at you and now it's hundreds of thousands of people watching at home it looks like G2 couldn't handle the pressure before. Now they've got no, Rain's got no one to kind of look back to and kind of ask what's going on. Fnatic have that kind of uh, extra like, buffer, I guess, to kind of help them out in these big pressure situations. All right, guys. Well, thank you very much for your thoughts. I think we Always. covered a lot of ground in this segment. We're all favoring toward Fnatic, but the only thing that will dictate exactly what happens is, of course, going to the game. And to do that, we do send you to the Face It duo. It's James and DDK. Hello, everyone. Do we have sound? I don't hear I, myself. I, I, okay, I can I hear myself I now. I think Marvelous. We have sound. We have sound, Dan. Dan. That's good, that's good. We have sound. We're doing better than the, the Russian guys then. Here, I think I did yeah. sound for a while there. Pretty, it's a, this is a pretty, pretty cool arena. I mean, Starlight have really leveled up this time. I was it's extremely a, presently it's surprised. It's a massive difference, isn't it? Yeah, it's insane, the level of quality we are seeing here. The stage looks awesome. The crowd is awesome. The place is completely packed out. We've got people around us over there, in front of us as well. And you can see some people behind us. Uh, it's looking pretty good. We've got spider cam flying around as well. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, looking great. So we're going to have, I think we have Cash, Inferno, then Dust2 as a decider. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Makaleli always says that Cash is uh, G2's best map. We know they're pretty keen on Inferno, but really, I've been really interested in how Fnatic have been playing Inferno on the CT side. So uh, I'm quite curious as to how G2 will do that. I think you have to favor Fnatic in this series. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the other thing to mention, of course, and on the desk, you know, they talked about it as well, is that with G2, they had they had the same same two maps. You're thinking Cash Inferno, brilliant. That's fantastic for G2. They they got a perfect veto. How on earth did this even happen that they get such great maps for them? And then Cyber Zen, you know, as you know, relatively unknown teams, not really come to you know European events before to face these teams. They should have won that series on 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 the second map, which was actually Cash in that case. And then they kind of steamrolled them on on Inferno. But the thing about this is. G2 
they are big game players as well. When they get onto the stage, this is you know this is their their environment where they can really start to shine because you've got a lot of like Michael Ellie, for example. He always plays a lot better when he's got the stage and he brings his team up. And you've got all the star players of that lineup. They they always seem to do better in that environment. So I'm I'm looking for that. I'm looking for the big I'm place. I'm there. This place, <laughs> my the stage is shaking. That looks like we are going so much like pace. That. Yeah, so. It's like I'm in a Skrillex gig. Let's go, 10 seconds, countdown, into the warm-up, of course. All right, is this the knife? It's the knife round. The knife, okay. See, I feel, like, I feel like the countdown into the pistol round would be much more hype. But there we go, we'll find out who's gonna start on the CT side. There's a best of three, sometimes you see the knife winners opt for the uh, T side instead. So time will tell on this occasion. Yeah, Fnatic actually are the team that started to do that initially. They were the f I think, yeah, yeah they, were, they were actually the first to do that. I think Nip, Nip would often pick T side of Inferno. In yeah, the yeah, three. yeah, right. LIP used to do it, I think, for a different reason. I mean, at least uh, Fifth Larini used to talk about how NIP were a team that they wanted to start on the worst side just because they felt like they played worse at the start of the best of three. So they wanted the warm up in the, uh, the side which they didn't expect anything from. And, but I think Fnatic, they, they got the straps, man. They got the, they got the drills. And uh, with uh, some of the changes as well, I think it's gonna you know, help the, the tease out with longer bomb timer and so on. So I think T-Side got a slight buff in that last patch. Either way, the knife round will conclude. You can see a lovely shot there of the booth with Fnatic and Bugo standing behind his teammates. And uh, what an arena here, 8,000 people. Of course, the eight, it's an 18,000 uh, person capacity, but as you can see the screens um, over there, you can't really <laughs> you don't have a great viewing experience from behind the screens. So Den Dennis is trolling the uh, G2 guys. I don't know if you can see that on the camera, but uh, he must be chatting to them because he's like fist pumping and looking over to their booth. So yeah. I think there's uh, some jolly camaraderie there. Man, does Crims really need three containers of sluice there on that desk? Does he really need three? <laughs> Look, man, it's a special guy, experience being he's on stage. Going in. He's, he's got that mad sponsorship game going on. Yeah, always, always with the snooze. From, oh, from a distance, that. these headphones actually look like eyes on the spider cam yeah. behind the monitors. These, those headphones are actually amazing, I must say. I use those at the play call. Yeah, indeed. And it's uh, going to be very interesting to see if we get that big game out of G2. Because if we do, it's going to be amazing. Because Fnatic are also amazing on the stage. These are two stage teams. How many lands has, has AZ been at with G2? Um, I don't know that he has actually. Yeah, I'm, done I'm, a big I'm, I'm wondering. And AZ actually initially, he used to play for Dignitas back when, uh, just before um, they moved to the TSM lineup with, uh, with Carrigan, and the TSM brand, uh, you know, way back when. Back then AZ's issue was, I mean, they, they loved him as a player, but his issue was that he couldn't really handle the stage pressure because he was so young and he needed the experience. And then TSM, of course, uh, or ex-TSM now, they wanted to make a grab for him, obviously, uh, some months ago because they felt like hey, AZ's remedied this now. We saw this, actually, uh, you know, that he's been performing massively well at some of the lands on his past teams, but we've yet to see him really gel very well and fit in very well with his, his new team, G2. Right, so it would be the tournament to do it, wouldn't it? Would indeed. So as we can see, Fnatic are going to be starting on the CT side. We saw a mention on the desk of the lack of kits in the pistol round from CTs with the additional diffuse time. We'll see if they go for one here. I think maybe it does vary on the maps depending on the rotation time between sites. As you can see, Crims is going to pick one up on this occasion. And the HE to boot. The rest of the team going to be on the Kevlars. Four Kevlars for G2 with Makelele going to be the nade man for that team. So once again, we're seeing a somewhat standard pistol run from the CT side in that they go, they're playing for retake A. From the position that Crims is holding, you can't actually hear anyone uh, when, the, when the squeaky door is open. So I'm still waiting for one day everyone to just rush through squeaky and take the A site. You know, we do have the push coming in here from G2. Crims picking off one there as Jacob goes in and quickly falls. And the bomb will be planted there by G2. So they'll start forcing the CTs to move. But it's kind of by design here. We're looking at an A retake setup from Fnatic. They're just going to try to get players in all the positions and then coordinate themselves into the bomb site. You can see Olaf is waiting there for the flank from JW to come into play. Uh, JW, very important in that squeaky position. There's no Ts to cover it. There's two Ts in the team main area, as we can see. And look how, how slow Fnatic are taking this. Waiting for that perfect moment. Olaf Meister getting the first kill. There's the second one. JW makes his presence known, and it is brutal. What beautiful play there from Fnatic. Lovely plan, lovely execution. It all comes together just as they had initially 
planned it all to be. That was really interesting, actually. Makalele and AZ were in the uh, main area. Makalele shooting through the smoke towards Car, but obviously AZ was at the back of main looking for the flank from JW. But JW, uh, he was w walking all the way through Squeaky. AZ wasn't holding the angle, so didn't see him go past. Then JW is able to pop out and shoot somebody on the site. Very nice retake there for Fnatic. Everything, everything is so uh, slow and deliberate with the Fnatic side that we've seen in this tournament, which is quite nice. G2 looking for a fast execution with a flashbang into the B bomb site. JW could make it rain with this gun. Going to reposition, drop HE, and going to do massive damage with that. Flusher's on the side as well. Going to take down McAnally. We've got a Molotov kill from Flusher. And I don't think the bomb's going to get planted here. Down in the middle of the site. Full rotation coming in from the CTs. One kill uh, from Fox onto Flusher. He kind of just bounces into his crosshair. But other than that, minimal damage done to Fnatic. Yeah, G2, they, they weren't expecting all too much from that situation. They're just playing for the third round AK bias. We can see it coming out right now. And generally speaking, what I really like to see teams do from this position is to abuse the fact that the AKs are typically going to be superior to what the CT side will still have because it's such an early buy. Although, JW has been able to afford an AWP here, and that's a very, very big deal. We'll have to see how much that's going to be coming into play there from the B-bomb site, which is where he initially is, because the push from G2 is making its way over to the A site. Looks like they just want to go in here. No messing around, no mid-round, just go straight for the push. Dennis is holding uh, counter flash there, but he's messed it up. Maybe having a read on what, it, what to expect from G2, obviously, have, being a recent player for them. That re-smoke's going to come in. The advantage of JW holding down the AWP and B is that they can boost uh, Flusher into the vent, so he can play mid and just leave JW solo with the support there, should he require it. But Dennis seems to know what to expect here and is waiting for the push to come in with that flashbang. Is he going to have a good timing on it though? And yeah, there's the flash and that was pretty effective but the entry is found by Michael Elliott. Now Rain goes through the door. What can he find here? He needs to get another entry. Krims holds it down there with the MP7. Great stuff coming in from Fnatic as Olaf Meister still rocking this offense and it's just AC left. Quick two man for him but no health. And there is the touchdown from JW to finish the deal. I mean some damage was done. But the question is, was it enough? And will Fnatic be able to stabilize in the subsequent rounds? An important 3K from Olaf Meister there. Important that even though Dennis went down, he got the flash, which stunted the push of the T side. And those kind of flashes are always going to help. So a good start from Fnatic so far. JW continuing with the AWP. I'm not sure if he had a good spawn for B. We will have a look as there are two players headed in his direction. He's setting up for the shot now. But uh, we've got one player already past the angle. It is G2 on the eco, so JW will want to be careful here. He does have Flusher for support, and that will allow him to be able to reposition. Flusher playing from the headshot position. And uh, we might see G2 slowly gravitate towards the bomb site. They have no grenades, though, no pop flashes to be had. So uh, they're going to need to be successful. It's going to be hard, I think, for them to take down Flusher in that angle, especially with JW in for support from CT. Yeah, here they come. This should be pretty easy for Flusher. Good uh, recoil control. They're not uh, getting a really fast frag. That might be problematic, but there is the spray coming in from Flusher. He's looking strong, and there is four kills in a row from Flusher. He's still alive. No damage done by G2. They're going to feel fairly gutted that they couldn't get that kill. But here comes the buy once again. So the pressure will be back on top of Fnatic more or less immediately, and we will see an AWP on Michael Elliott. And I'm very curious to see how that will allow G2 to open up the map, because there's lots of options for such an opera as Michael Elliott. I really feel like they just needed somebody with a smoke and a flash there, but I'm not sure if Makai has a good spawn to go for the peak into mid straight away. Flash is going to get flashed, but the smoke's going to be down just in time, so Makai was close to the gap, but he's not going to make it. The vent's open, and Flusher will be playing close with Olof Meister at the back of mid at the moment. KW left over towards the bomb site on his own at present. We have a uh, Fox headed in that direction, but he's got the AK, McElhinney, with the AWP, as Dan mentioned. We'll see if that changes later on. I do wonder if he was playing that based on spawn. And so far, it's, it's a, a default, and this is uh, generally what you would expect when the AWP gets picked up, because you, you want to try to get the picks going, and Michael so far has been able, unable to do so. And time is beginning to run a little bit low. We're well into the mid-round at this point, and G2 haven't taken any major map control. They position themselves into a main. We might see the opening engagement, and there you go. That that smoke grenade is going to be perfect for Dennis to get a better engagement. Michael Lely couldn't even see him, and that's the AWP gone now. G2 going to be a little bit desperate in this position, because they're down a man. They've got no pick to show for it. The nades are running out for Fnatic, and G2, they've got quite a few smokes to play with, so they can scrap together and execute. Let's see if it'll be successful. 
Yeah, they're going to need the Angels there. I think that's been obvious from the start of this round. Coming in for the push eventually. Still in the choke point, though. No? Dennis holding the angle. He's going to get wrecked by AZ. We've got one more Fnatic player on the site as Dennis goes down. And there's going to be massive frags for Fnatic. Crims with two, leaving Rain alone. Unable to plant the bomb either. And it seems, you know, G2 are a team who don't really have a true in-game leader. They need an in-game leader. And you can see um, Makalele jumping into A main, looking for a pick there. Despite having all the nades, they don't seem to be looking for the executes at the moment. And I think that's going to be a problem. It was a glaring problem against, uh, I think it was CyberZen previously, where they were just basically rushing sites and going for picks. That's not really going to work versus Fnatic. And uh, one, one thing that Peter in North America does as a player on the A-bomb site is he jumps on top of the barrels. You can see McAlealy jumping into the angle on the T side to try and uh, get a quick peek onto someone holding a usual angle. Peter would be on the CT side standing on top of the barrels to counter that. Uh, which is something we might see later. But again, G2, they, they're really going to struggle if they don't have executes on what is supposed to be their best map. Yeah, it's going to be, a, well, essentially just a bit of a quasi-buy from G2, already on the max uh, round loss bonus uh, of $3,400. So just trying to see what damage they can get done. And so far, Fnatic have been winning rounds quite cleanly. So they do need to be making some frags in rounds like this to try to just work on that Fnatic economy, get it down so they can try to force Ecos when they do start winning those buy rounds sooner rather than later. And we will have the movement coming in. It's great control coming in from Fnatic, the way that they're positioning around the Ts. They know exactly what's, what positions are being given up. They're repositioning themselves and forcing G2 through choke points, through, through to engagements that they just cannot win. So limited damage done, and we will see now Fnatic with six rounds, but G2, they picked up an AWP, and this time it's on the star AWP of the team, Fox. All right, so let's see what, where Fox is here. Yeah, Fox has a reasonable spawn as well, but he's not gonna go for the mid pick straight away. Fnatic are getting the smoke out quickly. In fact, he's going to go for the uh, fast boost. Olof Meister to buy the sandbag. Fox is going to get a tag, I think. Indeed, he is. The nade going towards short as well. Fox losing to the flames, though, after being tagged himself. So, advantage Fnatic. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see if they can actually bust through here after losing one player. Fox down, as mentioned. In, in goes Michael Ellie. They know they need to scrap together some kind of a play. He's got himself a bit of an engagement there. His teammates lagging behind a little bit. It's unclear as to where they want to finish. I mean, there is the option for an A split, you know, potentially, or the B split. Depends on how they can position themselves, whether it's in towards A main or towards B storage. And so far, we're seeing G2 work on that B storage, finally. Worth noting, though, that Fnatic are doing something that they were commonly doing on Inferno as well, is that rotate, they were rotating an extra person over towards the A site and leaving B a bit vulnerable. But with the control that Fnatic had towards, sorry, that King had towards mid, they've had to put a second player back and abandon that mid area. So they're going to be lacking information, but JW with a nice pick there into the vents. That smoke's going to deny them yet more information, which may cause a bit of a rotation considering they have no information towards mid either. You can see Fnatic now streaming down towards the B site making uh, a good read that G2 may be favoring it. Dennis with a lot of information here. It could come in from the flank in mid. We've got Luftmeister having an eye on A just in case there's someone in squeaky, but the push should be coming in soon from G2. Yeah, absolutely. The flash on the side there. He's being burned alive, actually. He used to try and reposition, and that's exactly what G2 wanted. JW gets the shot as AD jumps up onto the site. He's under a lot of pressure right now. He's got no support. What a shot there from JW. Close range with the orb, and the rest of his teammates come in, and JW will still survive. And that's going to be another round where Fnatic are basically playing incredibly efficiently. They're preventing G2 from getting the damage in with the, with the frags. G2 need to be making more frags in these rounds. But before that round even got going, JW got... Well, two kills. Yeah, that was very nice play, the no scope there from JW. G2 just looking for the picks again. They're looking for the picks and Fnatic are not giving them the opportunities. They're not playing, they're not allowing G2 to play to their strengths basically. G2 looking to move fast into A main with three people. Are they gonna come out of the choke point though? They're behind the smoke at present and that should be enough. Jacob's on the lockers. You can see over the corner of the smoke towards where Dennis is uh, standing, but closer towards quad rather than the NBK position. We've got the pressure coming in from G2 once again in towards the A main area. And the Fnatic just feeling it out. They don't have any information. That smoke is is a good thing and a bad thing for Fnatic. Of course, you know, it, it's good in that it prevents G2 from trying to make any open picks, but it's bad because they don't know what's going on behind there. It could be the entire team behind it, and in, that's actually the case. And we can have a very fast 
a set play that's not telegraphed from behind the smoke, and that might be what G2 are thinking about. We're not going to see a set play from G2. They, they need to run and gun. That's the problem. Is it going to work out for them? No, they've got enough numbers to trade, and I think that's what they're going to rely on here. Dennis at the back. Prim's running distraction, but Dennis is not going to get any frags either. There's still Olaf Meister on the side. Two frags for him. Going to get traded by Rain. Man advantage for G2 now. All three members on the site. Can JW and Flusher retake the site? The yeah, Olafmeister well, made that possible now for the remainder, remainder of Fnatic. And they got so much cash, I should think, that they do want to go for this, get the damage in to G2. See a quick uh, flash out there to allow Rain to get a peek, and he's going to spot both players. So G2 know exactly what's going on in this position. And Fnatic probably not going to want to go for this unless they get a kill onto Rain. And there it is. Now they can actually go in and try to commit for this. Flash goes in for a Flusher to try to get something done here. Michael Ailey with a quick headshot, though, onto Flusher is going to stop the effort with the help of Jacob. And finally... Finally, G2 get themselves on the board with the rounds, but that did cost them quite a lot in resources, so they've got to be careful in this follow-up. On the subject of resources, JW starting with 16k, Dennis has bought some north, JW yet to buy, so Fnatic setting up for that double AWP setup, so there we go. G2 just literally playing the numbers game, four people rushing into the A site, enough to trade versus the uh, two, maybe three players of Fnatic, but that's an expensive round for the G2 players. Seven, Fnatic seven rounds in a row, if they take this round, then they could extend to an even more considerable lead. So JW is, well, sorry, Dennis is going to be over towards the A site in a usual position. This where he's standing now is where you can potentially see him if you're standing on the lockers in main, which nobody's doing at the moment for G2. But it seems if it's not broken, they're not going to fix it. Four people in A once again. I think there's one person just checking for a boost there. Fox going down in main, and AZ's going to answer back, and here comes a push from uh, G2. Yeah, it's looking like this could be quite strong, but there's Crims. Can he get the double? No, he won't. He'll get shut down by Jacob in the end, and that's going to avail G2 into a bomb plant now as Olaf Meister makes his way into the flank. And G2, they don't have anybody watching the flank just yet. Olaf Meister could be incredibly powerful in this position as that smoke's still down, and finally there is some attention there, but Olaf Meister's getting the damage in. A lot of pressure, a lot of directions for G2 to try to look towards, to try to hold this bomb site down, and Flash is coming in now. Olaf Meister, Flasher doing insane damage and that's three frags in a row going all the way towards Fnatic. G2 looked very very desperate right there and very panicked indeed. Benefit for G2 is that they got the bomb plant so we'll see how much money they have to buy with in a second or two. And that's going to be very key if they don't if they can't afford the buy then Fnatic could have a 12-3 half it. Yeah what a stage. I'm still in awe on how great it looks. The grandeur of it all is fantastic. Star Series have done a knockout job there. But back into the match, we'll see G2 on, again, a quasi by. Well, actually, in fact... We can't see how much money they have. Yeah, right? their, money is, their money, in theory, should be wrecked because they just got reset, actually. So their lo loss bonus has, has gone to down the toilet. But they have managed to scrap together some, uh, uh, some pistols. So it does make me think that, oh, that we're going to see a, a buy next round. But perhaps they could even get something going here. They actually will be able to steal away an M4. Well, they're all in mid. What are they going to do with it? Can't plant the bomb there, so it looks like the B split is in order. Four men through the vent, and uh, we're going to have Jacob coming in from T spawn. So they're all spreading out, which is great news. And I think the bomb site's been abandoned by the CTs. Flusher coming in. There's a big rotation. Can they plant the bomb, though? Flusher eventually going down. Three versus three. Not sure if G2 can reach Flusher's gun here. JW going for the wallbangs. That box where the bomb was planted is wallbangable, but it's too late now. They've left the position. Yeah, got AZ there with that Deagle. Can he get any more damage? Can he show star power? Trying to get that peek into a 1D. It's not quite happening. It's a bit awkward at the moment. As Fnatic make life difficult for G2. Two players on the bomb site. The fire goes down as well. There's almost no space to breathe as AZ looks for a peek. And again, such patient play from Fnatic looking to coordinate. But they can't quite find a fast frag just yet. And there you go. AZ finally getting a deke shot onto JW. But it's all left to JKM. Long range with a Tech 9. Onto that bomb. It's not going to happen. And Fnatic once again proving that patience, composure, and experience are going to be winning them rounds. Yeah, it seems Fnatic have had big adjustments to the new timers there. Just such patient play. Whereas previously, that might be a bit of a more desperate situation for the CTs. Another good retake there. The HEs from the CTs thrown up towards the boost point, I think are not even worth throwing, to be honest, because 90% of the time it does maybe 5 damage, maybe 10 damage. It's such a weird spot for HEs that, uh, unless you're throwing a Molotov, I just, I just wouldn't even bother throwing a HE up there. So G2 
looking towards a fast B perhaps. They've got the wall of smokes in, which is going to allow Makalele to split through the vents, but he's got someone chasing him very quickly indeed. That's Olaf Meister. So he can raise the alarm for Flusher, who's the only person on the B bomb site here. He's going to be in a lot of trouble. Yeah, he's got a decent position to work with. And of course, actually, G2 boosting back out into the vents to try to meet the rotating Fnatic players. It's trying to make this complicated. Flusher, though, able to gun down Michael Eli, who has limited support. It's all falling apart on the seams here for G2, as they don't quite have a strict plan in play. Michael Eli almost just going rogue away from the main pack, the main herd of G2 players, as the rest of his teammates boost through the vents, splitting the effort in a spot where they needed to crush the site. And Fnatic are going to punish all day, every day. Yeah, this is a pretty savage half so far. You can see the money on the G2 side. Let's see what the buy is. Let's see what the buy is. Okay, so they're back on the pistols again. So again, this could be a 12-3 half or even worse. AZ getting another deagle shot as Dennis goes for a fast push. We've got people coming in squeaky as well. Crimson might be too close for comfort there. Bomb goes down, that means full rotation. He's got two players in for support as well. Olof Meister taking down Makaleli. Can the T players cross to the site? Fox taking the high ground, but unable to finish off JW. Trey's coming in for both sides, down to two versus two. Down to one versus one. Reign's going to finish it off there. Absolute chaos and mayhem is what's required for G2 to win around in this half. Makaleli will get a, a token AWP for his troubles. But really, there's not many rounds for them to uh, to get at this point. And Fnatic should have a fair amount of money to go for another full buy. Yeah, and uh, one thing when it comes to playing a team that you think is, is generally better than you, chaos can be one of the best ways to go. And I wonder whether G2 will realize this or not. Um, if we'll see more chaotic plays in, in the nature of that rush with the buy rounds, we'll have to see. It is quite risky either way. We'll have the... Bomb actually alone towards B storage, very, very defensively on the uh, on the back of AZ. And G2 just playing a very default kind of setup. They're spreading oh. players around the map. They're, playing causing, they're causing a massive over-rotation here from Fnatic. The B bomb site's been completely abandoned. JW desperately trying to get back there in time. Olaf Meyer's taking down Rain elsewhere. JW's going to miss a shot, but he's got the information for his team. But this might be a difficult retake because there's a reasonable amount of nades here. Olaf Meister has other ideas. Has a two massive impact frags, four versus two now. And G2 are going to have a lot of trouble holding the site. Yeah, this is going to be very difficult, but at least they got AZ left on that bomb side. Strong player again, in a position to have to clutch for his team. Show us what he's made up. Vic comes in from JW, he won't land it on the target though. As AZ gets a little bit more breathing room, but Michael needs to get this done here in this position. He's got to hold tight for AZ. AZ cannot be attacked from two sides at once. AZ's going to win the battle against Flusher. Michael Eni wins another fight, picks up the AWP, and AZ is going to shut it down. And Fnatic will finally lose one more round, but it still seems so laboured and so difficult for the G2 side to put these rounds together. I'm curious as to what the financial situation is for the Fnatic team. Well, JW's got 10k in this situation, so I think we're going to see another buy coming in. JW with uh, two frags from one AWP shot there, but it wasn't... Oh, that was a previous round, okay. Never mind. All right, two rounds left here in the first half. So we're going to have a uh, bit of a mixed bag here from Fnatic. They're going to go for the fourth buy. Three rifles, JW and Dennis, going to be on the pistols in this situation. So. G G2 may get a reasonable score out of this, yeah. Absolutely, and we're seeing a similar play here from uh, from Fnatic, where they get their smokes, their defensive smokes. That's how they want to play against G2. They want to try to deny the uh, deny the picks, and uh, it's going to be Crimson that is going to actually get the frag through the smoke there with their AWP. Big loss, as you can see, G2 are setting themselves up middle. They want to they wanted to get a potential split going, but the bomb is alone in a main, so this could be very problematic as they have a strong push through mid, but the support needs to be there for the bomb as the, they will finally snap into the bomb site. But you can see a lot of trouble here as Fnatic move out of their positions to meet these players and G2 in a three versus three. Can still make this happen. Fox picks up the kill there. As you can see, G2 kind of stuck in the mud a little bit. The bomb still can't make its way to the site and now that's all that's left. JK with a bomb on his back against two. Crims has a passive angle. So JK may be able to, unable to uh, find the one versus one he's looking for. And I'm not sure if the plant can be heard from there, but indeed we're starting to see movement from Flusher on short. So Jacob has the AK, but he's going to get taken down by Crims. A 3K for him with the AWP. Very nice stuff indeed. So back to losing ways for G2. 11 to 3 now. We may see the 12-3 from Fnatic after all. Only two players alive though to pick up some weapons, and we did see that the money was tight. So the CT economy may not be in the best place for the final round of the first half, and. In that sense, G2 might have an advantage, but it might be rough for both sides at this point. Yeah, and you can see Fnatic are really in their element at the moment, it would seem, is, especially as we saw you know, Dennis on the end there, very jovial mood, bit of a giggle, having a bit of a 
banana grin on his banana grin on his face. Uh, that's always good to see, you know, teams in good spirits. I'd like to see, you know, how G2 are looking uh, in a moment because they've got to be sweating at the moment. They've got to be sweating bullets because this is not working out for them. We'll get a quick boost here. This could just work as well. Flusher looking over the top there. Will he be able to get the spot? Fox is looking for the pick. Rain is in front for distraction to help support Fox. Fox, it would be great if Fox had a flashbang to flash his teammate in, but he doesn't. And his teammate, Rain, only has a Tech 9. Closing a distance in the uh, checkers, but he's going to be forced out with the Molotov. Great response from the CT side there. So again, mid's being given up to the side, to uh, the T side, excuse me. They've got three players in there, so they could set up for the B split here, considering the positions they currently have. The bomb, though, still in T warehouse, so... The lack of people over towards A would mean that it's moving towards B, and indeed the split is coming in here. JW playing a sneaky position. Is it going to work out for him, though? Sees Rain, but can he punish? No, he's going to get taken down by Flusher. Sorry, Flusher's going to get taken down. But JW's still alive, getting another frag for his team here. Three versus three as the CT's come in for the retake. Through the smoke, Olaf Meister will get taken down. We could see an 11-4 here. Yeah, we've got uh, Crims and Dennis on the retake there for Fnatic. It's going to be a very difficult one, but the bomb was only just set down, so there is time for them to make this one work. They both have kits as well. They've previously shown a great amount of patience in these situations. This time is the, the first time we'll see them looking at a big disadvantage, but again, it's the last round, so they have to go for it. And here we go, Dennis, making his way up higher, looking for the first shot with that great vantage point as his teammate goes for the pressure. Crims goes down, two players facing at once, and we will see the 11-4, so somewhat of a... So, some, some salvation at the end found there by G2, but it was a very tumultuous story for them. On the, on the first half, and it's going to be difficult to see how them scrap together a strong second half with only four rounds. I feel like the way G2 are playing at the moment, in general, they badly need to start on the CT sides of Max. Because that's where they can just hold, they can put Fox on an angle, he's super fast, and he can wreck people towards one site, and they can concentrate most of their forces towards towards A, basically. You know, Jacob's in there for backup, if need be. When they start on the T side, you see the struggles there. They, they, their approach is, is lacking, to say the least. Again, they, they, they say themselves they need, they need an in-game leader, and you can't disagree with them. So uh, it could have been, it could have easily been a lot worse than the current score, but they've got some breathing room to try and hold, but first comes the pistol, and this is going to be crucial for them. Makalele with the diffuse kit and the smoke, the rest of them are going to be on the Kevlar. Flusher, the nade man for the Fnatic side, got some initial boost coming in. Perhaps they're going to go for a mid take. That's actually quite a cool boost there because I think that will actually spot a timing if a CT runs close. So I think JOW will always be able to see that, which, which is very cute because now they know that there's no one close left. So very cool stuff there. Nice small touches. And speaking of uh, touches, that's a strong one there from Crims. He takes down AZ with, with the Glock already and now mid is under control for Fnatic. So G2 in a pretty awful spot because they have no information as to what's going on, whether middle is uh, even occupied at this point. And Ray's going to get a quick peek in there just to see if the Fnatic side have actually moved either towards A or B at this point. And you can see that they're just holding their ground, waiting for more information placed to try to punish. And so far, Fnatic, again, just playing it patiently, if coordinating themselves and going for the A plate. Indeed, and if they leave a lurker in mid, then it's going to be leave a funnel for G2 coming from the car position, but JW going down might not allow that to happen. Moving towards A now, they're going to have the crossover from the car position. No frags for the CT side yet. They've still got one player holding that position now, waiting for his team to come in. So it is going to be a retake but from short and the car area with four Fnatic players on the side, spread out in three directions. McLeary first to go down, man advantage for the Ts now. Not anymore, Olof Meister has been taken down by Rain. Two players from the uh, forklift position for the Ts, fighting with Dennis, but not going to get any frags just yet. Still trades for both sides. Now we've got Ts running all over the place, jumping around corners to avoid being headshot, down to one versus one. Fox, can he get the third kill of the round against Flush, who's holding tight in the door? Oh, this is absolutely brutal. This is ridiculous. He doesn't have a kit either. Surely he can't win this round. This is very uh, frustrating indeed for Fox. Eventually gets a kill. There was a kit onto Makaleli, but he doesn't know where it is. And he's going to have to make a run for it. <laughs> you can see that Fnatic are loving it. That's such a good way to win a round as well because, I Benny mean, Hill, please. I mean, it's so f horribly frustrating and definitely a bit demoralizing for G2 and for Fnatic. It's so uplifting because they know, they know what it's like to be on the end of that kind of a play. It's definitely not a good look for G2. Now, G2 can actually, they can actually still turn this around. G2, again, are a strong team. We already saw AZ with some excellent Deagle plays. And they do go for the Force Buy. Fox is the only one who didn't buy anything because he wants to save for the AWP, which is a very reasonable uh, decision. 
But his teammates, they really need to do a huge amount of damage, just win the round outright with the Force Buy. And we've seen them do that many, many times before in Cash. So don't count out G2 just yet. But that said, Fnatic have been showing great anti-eco drills all tournament long. So we'd expect to see that after a passive opening that they come together for some, of some kind of an execute to just limit the options of G2. And you can see they're using this extra time to just give G2 an opportunity to hang themselves, allow them to overextend one way or another so they can punish them for it. Two players holding towards B from Fnatic just in case there's a rush around the corner that one of them can't handle. Three AKs, so they'll have the range advantage should they need it. Not many nades left though on Fnatic, two HEs and a flashbang, and they're coming together to move towards a site as a unit, which perhaps could be A. G2 with basically no information, gonna have to gamble. That is a good timing for a smoke grenade to come into A. So that that's that's this can cause the bedlam that uh, G2 are looking for. Yeah, it's, it's still going to be set up for this A play. The smoke is just going to slow Fnatic down slightly, but they have got very forward positioning now for the push. And in the smoke actually, uh, well, actually, hold down fort because I think we're about to get the engagements now as Fnatic have got Olaf Meister in the position, but he's going to get shot in the back of the head by AZ. Big play there from him. Can he try to make it even better? He will. Another frag coming in the 5 7. AZ looking for the triple. He's not going to find it. It's going to be Fox in the end taking down Dennis, leaving his team in a two versus two. But now it's all on Jacob and Fox to try to bring this to a W. It's going to be hard for them to get close to the guns, though, to get the real firepower going. JW is vulnerable with 34 HP. But other than that, this should be the round for Fnatic. Jacob's got an AK now, and that could change things. Down to the one versus one. He has full armor, so this is anybody's. Jumping around the corner, seeing Crims, and he's going to take the round for his team. That is absolutely crucial. Is there enough time? I think there's enough time for the defuse. That is the round G2 needed. If they didn't get that round, then really that could have been curtains, but the show hasn't ended just yet. Oh, yeah, and again, so this is that situation where now they've reset the economy of their opponents. Fnatic, Fnatic won't have any money. They won't have any loss bonus, so this is uh, even better than winning the pistol round. You do concede a round for it, and arguably it's actually worse because there's so few rounds uh, that G2 have already. And uh, we, we, we'll be in a situation now where they should be able to secure a good economy on their, their CT side, and Fnatic likely have forced, in fact, actually no, uh, Fnatic have gone for the save. They got the bomb down, that would probably be the reason for that one, as uh, that would allow them to buy in the next round and get the pressure on as soon as possible with actually a good buy. But it's all on G2 in this round to not lose a single player and to not concede a bomb plant. That is the, the must in this round. So Fox and Jacob down to the usual shenanigans. Fox taking down Flusher. And uh, Jacob will be boosted into the vent at some point, if not already, so he can offer some mid presence if needed. So Fnatic needs to identify what the weakness is here for G2, and it's probably not Fox. Jacob holding an angle now, and he's got more players headed his way, but there aren't. Uh, there's no utility on Fnatic. Very nice play there. Very nice spray there from Jacob. No damage done to G2, which is very important for their economy going forward, but it's a nothing round. For Fnatic, there was an argument for them to try and force by there to ruin the CT economy as soon as possible, but they're preparing to play the slightly longer game of getting their full buy in rather than some uh, repeated struggled buys. Yeah, and to see JKM just going for it with a spray like this, this is a very stylistic from JKM. He is the one versus many kind of player. He's able to do stuff like this because his, his, his flair is in, uh, in fight tactics is so strong, his uh, spray is so good. So seeing him on point is going to be very important, and we'll see that deadly combo. With Fox and Jake him on B here. Fox looking for the first shot. He's going to miss it. And Fnatic getting closer and closer. They got the Tech Nines for the fast play. The Nades as well to back it up. And now it's on Jake him to support Fox. And he's going to get two kills on the spray down. Can he get anything else? They're going to go for the challenge. There's number three. Jake him trying to do it all by himself. 5 7 coming out. Fox with the last one for the finish. Beautiful hold there coming in from G2. That's what you expect from the Fox Jake him combo. Something to be very fearful of. So it's interesting that. Fnatic went for the uh, eco in the previous round and went for basically a force buy with I think two rifles and rested them on pistols, but unable to, they couldn't find the right angle to flash uh, both of the players, but you have to give credit to Jacob's counter flashes there off the uh, walls through the door where he's facing now, which is going to again slow the advance of the T's and stunt their pushes. And he does so well from this corner, time after time after time. So it looks like uh, Fnatic are going to the world one more time. This time, with a bunch of deagles and one flashbang onto Flusher, but how is he going to stop Fox? Because it's going to be hard for him to flash this angle, and indeed, he is going to fail. Fish in the barrel, unable to make a connection, though, is Jacob. Sorry, oh. is uh, Fox. Fox is going to go down to Olaf Meister. It's Jacob alone now, but he's got rain coming in quickly for support. 
leaving only JW with the AWP. So G2 in good position to rack up some rounds here. From the back, AZ will take JW. I mean, that was, that was a spot where, honestly, you know, Fox is looking like... <laughs> There, there's, they have to miss a shot there, it's very unlikely, because his screen is filled with players, <laughs> basically. And uh, Fox usually is the, the bedrock of the defense there. He's usually incredibly consistent with his orping. So to see him actually missing shots, I mean, I wonder if uh, Fnatic will pick up on this, because he's definitely not uh, hit his form just yet. Jacob, on the other hand, has, and because of that, uh, that's actually enough for them to be holding these B pushes. But I'm a bit worried for G2 after watching that round. Well, now we're going to have both teams on the buy once more. We've got Crims lurking towards the uh, squeaky area. McAnally's been boosted, as you can see there. JW, though, to take down Rain in mid. That's going to deny information for the CT side. But how fast will Fnatic move? AZ's rotating between mid and A, trying to get the info. He'll see nobody in mid. He'll, he won't know if anyone's under the vent in mid. But uh, they've put Fox in a very advanced position towards B, and they're banking on it being an A push. Yeah, this is a great position for Michael Ailey. Even though he hasn't got the silencer, he would do um, amazing damage if the distraction comes in at the right time. It's always chaotic moving through that choke point. You've got a uh, spot for four or five different positions, unless the smokes uh, do eliminate some of those, uh, those angles for you. And uh, Fnatic, they're gearing up for the push. They really want this A bomb site. And we'll have to see whether or not this is going to work out for them. There are two players there. Again, that key man is Michael Ailey. He is, he is the key here. And because there's no split just yet from short, he is, his position is not weak. That's, that's the real problem for his position. Anyone coming up short, and there's the spot. Oh dear, okay, now things could get really bad. Michael is going to be in a lot of trouble, but Jacob comes in. He's going to get the save on Michael Lele, and now Michael is able to do massive damage there from the choke point. Still though, Fnatic onto the bomb site with a man advantage. Make that, uh, well, it's still a man advantage. We do get the kill with that grenade coming in from Jacob in his last dying breaths, but now it's on Fox with the AWP. Flushes in the squeaky door. I think he might have closed it behind him as well. Although, judging by the positions of the two plays, he's probably holding an angle for his teammate, Crims. Moving towards... Yeah, indeed he is. Moving towards the... Uh, he's got so many places to look, does Fox. And there we go, Flusher should get the angle. Indeed, he will. Very nice angles being held there by Fnatic. Not much Fox could do in that situation, especially with an AWP. Removes the uh, versatility when he's probably going to end up in a crossfire there. So he was pretty much up the creek with no paddle. Back to losing ways are the CT side. Good thing is that they got a few rounds together where they lost very few players. So they should be having a good buy going into this, if I'm not mistaken. Four yeah. round gap now for the two teams. Yeah, very chaotic. But as you say, you know, four rounds, it's not a big... Five uh, rounds. Uh, five rounds, it's <laughs> not a big... Uh, Big deficit could be definitely a lot worse considering you know everything that we've witnessed. But uh, Jkem, you know, we, we really do want to see him on a rifle in this position, and he's so notorious to be you know in those close positions, even with the rifle. You'd expect the nades to zone him out from Fnatic. They really do want to take over the vent area, which is very good. You can try to do that as a T side, just push the CTs back out of the vent position, especially a team like G2, get them on the site, and then they don't know what's happening. And you don't even need to be there afterwards. It's just, you just want to deny that information. And we will see that that is generally a, a, an objective early into the round. Deny the CTs, push them back. But so far, so good here for G2. They have actually had three players around the vent area, and it does look like Fnatic, do you want to end up with the B split? There's a smoke at the back of T Warehouse, which... I can only assume somebody messed up. I'm not sure if they're going for like a wall of smoke somewhere, but whatever they were doing, it hasn't worked and there are no smokes left apart from one onto Fox. So you can see Fnatic trying to force the issue here. Commonly, we'll see Virtus Pro throw the uh, Molotov into the vent and have Snacks standing outside B to try and punish the play from going down. But Jacob's good at avoiding those kind of situations. AZ is completely exposed here, getting taken down by Dennis. Trades coming in from Rain, trades coming in from JW. Man advantage now for the T side. 20 seconds on the clock though, and McAlele could put a big stop to this, but he has to because he's all alone. Yeah, this is going to be really hard. There's the first frag. Very decisive. That's exactly how it has to go for Michael Ellie to clutch this one, but that's going to be all she wrote for Michael Ellie and Fox, leaving everything on a Mag 7 in the hands of JKM. He's going to pull out the USP because it's just not going to work at the ranges that he might be up against. This is so difficult. What does he do in this position? Flash goes in to try to cover himself, and it will work on Flusher, but there's just no way he can win a battle there. Just with that, that weapon, it's just not going to happen. He's going to fall back and maybe be able to pick up a weapon. But one key thing about this round is that G2 had a massive advantage. Fnatic were going for the B split. They wanted it. They had nobody towards A. Two players in B storage, three in middle, and 
AZ had a perfect position, really far forward. Dennis peaked at just the wrong moment for him. Rain did come out in that uh, spot to get the trade, but Rain couldn't get the second kill that he had the advantage for, and that made the difference. It opened up the path to the A site, and G2 lost that advantage, and now Fnatic are in a very, very good position to win this, this first map. Indeed, they are at mid, two rounds away from victory on the first map. Second one is going to be Inferno with Dust2 as a, as a decider, should it be required. Again, there are a lot of people. This is a very full arena. It's pretty insane here. But back into the match. Sixth round deficit here for G2 on the CT side with a force fire. They have a saved AK from Jacob and a bunch of pistols. Wall of Smoke's coming in pretty early for the Fnatic side, but AZ's over it already. Gonna have to make an exit though, as he is very vulnerable to being traded. And you've got a 5-7 and nobody there for backup. Rain playing under the boost, trying to uh, get a extremely awkward angle and any would-be assailants. And he's going to start pushing through, but it's not going to work out for him. Flash has to take him down with the M4, holding an angle on mid now. Again, Fnatic going slow, not really aggressive towards the B-bomb site. But we can see uh, perhaps a bit of a passive rotation from Flusher, just in case there's a push coming in from the uh, B area. So death by paper cuts here for G2. Jacob leaves the building as well. That's the one rifle they had down. Two players on the A site now for G2. They've got to hope that Fnatic go in that direction. Yeah, Fnatic have been very sneaky, actually, in how they've tried to just force rotation with grenades. We saw the wall of smokes in the middle of initially just to try to force movement and catch G2 when they're moving around. But uh, they, you know, they've managed to do a good job whittling down the defense. Now it's just three players left. AZ does have an AK-47. Michael Ellie will go down on the A bomb side as AZ makes his way in with that AK. He's going to do a ridiculous amount of damage if he wants to make this actually work out. There's the first frag. He's going to go for the spread. He knows where the players are behind the smoke. Oh, nice snap there from AZ onto Olaf Meister, but he will fall in the end. And it will be Fox running into his death. And that's going to be map points now for Fnatic. And this is a best of three. And it's the best of three that Fnatic are looking very strong in so far. So, what do G2 do? I don't think there's much for them to do in this position, James. No, I'm curious as to what their economy is like. It's, it's well, crap, James. Now we can see it. They've managed <laughs> to get two rifles, but one of them is a scout. And Fnatic are going for a, perhaps a fast play towards B. They don't really have any vision towards mid or A, so this is going to have to come in quickly before this flank comes in from G2. I don't think uh, Fnatic are going to have much issue here. Jacob's on the site with a 5-7, but there are multiple assailants coming in his direction. Dennis, can he get a trade on to Rain? Indeed he can. So far, so good. The CT's locked out of position. Olaf Meister looking for the flank, finding it in Makalele. He will go down. AZ headed towards the vent, but I think we are about to finish this map. Indeed, we are 16 to 8. Fnatic, I mean, the score really, it could have been like 16 3 by the end of it. I think that G2 were uh, fortunate to win some kind of mayhem situations to get a few rounds they did on their T side. But it'll be Fnatic taking the first map in its best of three, so I think we'll be. Uh, Having a few minutes before the second map starts. It's time for a rave, James. Yeah, it's time for a rave. Let's get the rave on, guys. Get out, get out your pink string vest. I got my glow sticks. I'll find some air horns. Let's get to it. Beautiful display here on the stage, though. I think those lights are looking for an in-game leader for G2. <laughs> the spotlights. He's made a run for it. You can see very, very good atmosphere there in the Fnatic booth. It's quite, it's quite a fun situation actually um, to see this kind of a setup because you know normally uh, it would be uh, the Eng English speaking in, in the arena. So now we're more of an obs you know the observers you know witnessing the grandeur of this in in such a, in a beautiful country in Belarus. In I love this setup. Look how sick this is. This is insane. Considering normally. It's in Kiev, basically in a land center where they just move all the computers out of the way and then make a stage in the main hall. They have some cool stuff there. They're like they've got some AKs in the floor with a bomb with a bomb timer, but this is definitely a humongous step up for Starlight. This is next level. This stage is looking absolutely amazing. But this is also, you know, an indication of what's to come this year. This Starlight have stepped it up because, you know, they're, they're a big player in, you know, in, in the, the CS tournament circuit. They're such a big brand, and you know, we love we love everything that's. Uh, 
that we've been involved with regarding Star Ladder. We've been to loads of tournaments. They've been there forever. They're representing you know, the, the Eastern European scene as well. And so you know, they stepped it up because this year is going to be a damn huge year for CS. I'm really excited. I think we should be get throwing to commercial break, I'm guessing. You think so? I, I don't know if we can hear production, but... Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm sure they're... Oh, okay, we've got makeup going on. <laughs> we need some makeup. Go for it. <laughs> are, we, are we even live, James? Мы принимаем ставки на компьютерные игры онлайн с 2011 года. Реферальная система для постоянных пользователей и бонус на первый депозит. Магазин игровых девайсов и лучший выбор платежных систем. Dota 2 и Hearthstone, Counter-Strike и StarCraft, World of Tanks и League of Legends. EGB.com. Ты точно знаешь, кто победит. Есть лишние скины? Хочешь выиграть реально крутые вещи? Заходи на ksgofast.ru, делай свои ставки и выигрывай реально крутые скины. ksgofast.ru. Проверь свою удачу. Well, thankfully, we had some Russian adverts in there to make sure we all get our uh, fix of CSGO skins and G2A's website. Uh, hopefully, everyone can understand how that works, because I'm pretty sure G2 might as well be speaking Russian with the way that performance went down. <laughs> I mean, one thing I've learned from coming to this area, uh, kind of mirroring my like understanding of the Western culture and now some of Eastern Europe, is that there's a suka born every day. <laughs> it's pretty Take good. Take home with you guys. It's good. It works on many levels. It's good. Right then, let's get into it, <laughs> shall we? <man? laughs> um, yeah, it was just a, a really disappointing start from G2. Like, it seems like the, the, the nerves haven't been shaken off. It was actually one of the most shaky performances I've seen from them ever on cash. Their T side was pretty abysmal. It was just a full-on panic every single round. Some key, note, some key rounds to kind of set the tone for the game, really. Like, they, they, they had a couple of really bad A executes, like misplay smokes, bad flashbangs, no Molotovs onto the execution, losing to SMGs in certain rounds as well. Like The first full force by they did, they were going to go to three Fnatic SMGs and actually lost on the bombs. I pretty convinced there and then that round where Fox they went for the fast mid boost Fox just standing in fire trying to get grenades off and like no scope people gets taken down that really just did set them up for this huge deficit luckily for them though I guess that Jacob once again was stepping up AZ was having some decent fragging it was just the three names I called out before this game Michael Ailey Rain these guys weren't performing once again it was it went to show that said I think they actually got off lightly with that scoreline it could have been much much more of a deficit though how the hell does a team that does this well at the Major fall this flat, though? On their own map pick as well. Uh, lack of leadership, that, that's obviously what it is. I mean, it was so painful to watch the, the, the beginning of that match. I mean, what uh, G2 decided to do on their T side, they were, the lack of cohesion was so obvious. I mean, they were just standing around in some sort of a default, but pretty much just waiting for, for some smokes to pass, and then they would go for an A, a execute, as uh, Henry mentioned, with some botched smokes, grenades. It's, it's not shocking. Yeah. It's actually like, like kind of like Pug-style fucking yeah, executes. It, it, was, it was really, really terrible, to be, to be honest, and I agree 100% that this could have easily been even a bigger score for Fnatic. They gifted them a couple of rounds, and I, I think that Fnatic felt in a way that they knew whatever was going whatever was going on in the game itself, they were going to win eventually because it was obvious the the disparity in in, in skill in this particular game. And uh, yeah, I, I feel that if I, I agree with you with what you said in the previous segment, uh, Duncan, that they're probably going to be you know a a farm team for, for bigger organizations, but if they, you know, if they still claim to be a team and they want to stay as a team, they need to make some, mm -hmm. you know, huge changes in, in terms of leadership, bring in maybe a coach or, yeah. you know, get, get that role sorted out. 
It, it just seems shocking it, as well because Dennis yeah. isn't like the big leader, and he's the only one that's gone. AZ's at the at the top level. We just saw he was the highest one on that map again, and still, you think that's a, a benefit, yes. not he's, a detraction from their skill. I mean, this wasn't a team at all. Like, it's here's the thing: it's not that playing a free for all style and having aimers means you can't be a good team. No, th that's funny. That's exactly what you need to be able to do the free for all style. You need to be like the classic old nip that had incredible synergy. You need to be like Envious that play off each other without having a set tactic because they've got the right sorts of players playing the right sorts of roles. This is how you're able to play that style. The problem with this team is it's like you can they can only play the aiming style because that's their limitation. They didn't choose yeah. to do that. That wasn't how the team was constructed, putting this guy with this guy. And actually, at the moment, when I look at this team, and some of the players are good players, I feel like it's like you tried to make a football team and you've got like three left wingers in the team. Like, mm -hmm. it doesn't make sense the way the team's set up. So as a result, if AZ's going crazy, can <laughs> we have Rain playing really well at the same time and Makaleli playing really well, but Makaleli can't use the ops now if they give the op to Fox. Like, there's so many problems and compromises in this team that actually they're less than the sum of their parts. And I think a good example of why you see them being so dysfunctional on the T side is you saw a lot of uh, multi kill rounds from the City players, you know, JW getting a double or a triple kill, uh, Crims on the A side, all of on the rotation. And what that uh, tells me is that even in, in those executes, they weren't so sure who's supposed to be looking at which yeah. spot, you know, because how, the, how does that happen? It's when a player peaks and he gets maybe the one guy looking at him and then gets you know, two players in a row yeah. after that. Usually when you see teams entering a bomb set in an execute, there are tra trades going around because everyone's covering a certain spot, you know, where you have to, you know, which spots you have to look out for. But here it was just, you know, terrible and they were completely dismantled by the Fnatic uh, side. On the flip side of that, on the Fnatic side, we did see Olaf, JW, and Crims yeah. as the top. <coughs> now, JW's had a good tournament, we already mentioned that, but Olaf and Crims stepping up this, is a good this step is one in the right of, direction. This is the, the Godline map we discussed before. I think once he had that great start on the pistol round, he was actually left on the A side by himself. He picked up three frags in that pistol round. That kind of set him up for a really successful campaign. He finished with, what, like 25 frags? It just show, goes to show, like, once you get that confidence back and you can feel the, the buzz on the stage, you can feel yourself getting into the zone, he just went on and absolutely wrecked them going forward. I see a really nice performance from him. Speaking of the stage, we do have an interview standing by right okay. now, so Duncan, I know you want to make a point. We'll come back to that. We're going to send it over to Smix, and we'll be right back in just a moment. Medic, so first of all, let me congratulate you to proceeding to playoffs. Uh, you had like a group of deaths qualified from the second place, so tell me a little bit about your ride in the group stage. Uh, yeah, we had uh, probably the hardest group I have ever played with. Um, and it was with both MVS and TSM and Titan, which all three are capable of beating us. So we were kind of scared of this group, but we were just happy that we uh, that we qualified for the playoffs. Is it true that Fnatic did not play for a while, like a one month break due to the Christmas holidays and stuff, right? Yeah, it's true. We had uh, maybe three weeks off uh, for Christmas and yeah, just because we traveled so much and had a lot of events and uh, yeah, so we had a, we had a quite a long break, but we started practicing one and a half week ago. So what about you? Did you spend some days off not playing CS or did you actually play CS during the breaks? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't play for a while, but I played a lot as well. I had a few days off, but not more than that. I, I always play country. I guess this is what makes you one of the best players from uh, last year. I guess some, some rumors that you're going to be awarded like the best player of the year. What do you think about it? Uh, probably one of the reasons, but I don't know if I'm the best or not. I, I'm just happy that my team wins a lot of events. That's that's what I care about. Right. So actually, you have the chance to prove that you're the best and your team the best. Uh, so good luck in the playoffs. I hope that uh, our team shows that we are the best. Thank you. Thank you so much. Exchange. Oh, second thing, we there we go. That would have been awkward if that's <laughs> literally where it went live in that sentence. And second thing, like you say, that uh, little bit outdated information, but does say that they're playing a little bit. Back to the point you were, you were about to say, just in general about that map. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting is we, we've pointed this out on the other days. Actually, the interesting thing about Fnatic is how many members of the team are now AWPing. Because obviously we know JW was the traditional AWPer, not in the traditional sense, but he was the guy who always was the main AWPer. Olaf Meister has always been a hybrid player his whole career anyway. And then actually last year, about a year ago, it was 
uh, Flusher, when he was in his slump, started messing around with it. But what, yeah. what's interesting, though, I've noticed is when you talk about letting different players use the AWP, like the Fox Makaleli situation, it's all about style dependent. So, for example, the reason why sometimes you now see Crims use the AWP is because he even uses the AWP the way he uses the rifle. It's very positional based. He does it because he wants to hold a spot from far away. He takes very smart shots. He doesn't go for the JW crazy flick angle shot. So, actually, he's one of those few players where he's not even a top two AWP on his own team. But sometimes I don't mind him doing that in that particular sense. There's a, there's a rationale, there's a logic behind why he does it. And I just thought it was interesting to bring up because he did see it a little bit in that game there. Mm -hmm. Now, moving forward into the next map, obviously we go on to Fnatic's map choice. Is there any hope at all for G2 and where do they even look to find it? Well, this, this is one of the maps. Am You're I, am still I muted. I don't know what's going on. Maybe uh, I guess you feel this one then. Do you hear me? I don't hear you. <laughs> but you guys, Duncan, you guys have, a, you guys have a chat. We'll just I, be we'll out there. I the plebs, Duncan. It's all you. <laughs> uh, um, I think for this particular map, I mean, this is obviously the one with the old Dennis lamp that they had the amazing game against Envious at the major on, but. You change 20% of the lineup, especially one a key piece like Dennis, who wasn't necessarily the individual performer, but he was like the person where when he joined, they turned the corner from being the, just the also runs to a, a proper team. I think on this map, it always starts and ends with the Fnatic CT side. Hello? If Fnatic have a really strong okay. CT side on this map, it's going to be very, very difficult. And so from what I saw on Cash here, I'm, I'm not really feeling it in terms of G2 because you look at it, what tactical prowess do they have? Where are the tactics even coming from? Like, it's not, that's the thing. If you didn't have any tactics on Cash, like they seemed to display they didn't, you wouldn't go so slow, you'd think. you think you'd go speed it up in that sense, you know? Don't give them chances to rotate on you. Don't use smokes and then wait. Like, I've never understood why people do that. Right. I feel like this is an NA CSGO problem, actually. They've seen a really complicated strategy done by an elite level team. They see, right, it involves like a, a one weird smoke they from try this direction it. here, and it has a flash here. And then you do it, but you don't know any of the reasons you're doing it. And so actually, all you're doing is just wasting a smoke and then wasting a flash. That actually, if you'd have taken the site, would have been more useful to you. So if a G2, either they better have an inspired performance by some of their individual players, or I just I don't see them being able to win it purely just because their T-side will be lackluster, I think. We're missing a great opportunity to just wreck them with no chance for a comeback at I, all. What, what is this? Can, we, can you tell them? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> if you can hear me, I've got some really interesting, cool things to yeah. say. So Yeah, he, he, see this is the funny part. He took notes this whole game. Like I've, got, I've got loads like, of cool okay. stuff. Do you want to just cast them down here man. and make yeah. me sound yeah. smart? Yeah. <laughs> I think we can come up with we've, got, we've, we've got loads of cool stuff here. <laughs> great. Uh, Okay, well, since we've got some time, you think this is obviously going to go 2 nothing? I mean, it does seem very much like it, it's hard to imagine it going another way at this point in time. I mean, remember, this okay. should have been the first map should have been the one that G2 should have been able to win. Maybe if they'd had the crazy performance then, they could have won. Am I even live right now? I think so, yes, you are. Yeah. But Yanko's gone over to tell production. <laughs> about the issue, so hopefully we can get this fixed up. Like I said, there's a Suka born every day. <laughs> Oh. And anyone who thinks that's a horrible thing to say is actually a P.T. Barnum quote. I'm just pronouncing it differently. <laughs> so, uh, Google is your friend if Go you don't Google understand it, the reference. Google it. And then go to Google Hello? Translate okay. and type it in there as well. So, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's the joke for you. Hello. Okay. Oh, hello. We're back. Oh, okay, all cool. right. Finally, we've Let's got go. Henry's notes. Well, no, that's how to take care of business, <laughs> boys. <laughs> well, what we, well, we've got we've got Inferno next, right? This is where we saw G2 play Cyberzen on this map. They actually got wrecked 16-6. So their actual approach to this map, if they're losing to the Asian team, where you kind of said is that it's just kind of nice they're here, kind of see what they can do. They didn't have a, com a competitive game against that team. How, what chance have they got going up against someone like Fnatic? It seems like it was one of the maps of the major. They actually were very good on different lineup. They played against Mouse Sports and they had a couple of good showings on Inferno. This is one of the maps where Fox was actually very good on the CT side of uh, um, with the AWP. He was very dynamic. He was going to different positions every single time. He was going towards Banana, getting picks, working middle, going towards Bedroom, for example. But I think on the first half of Cash, Fox finished on, what, 2 to 14, maybe? And it just doesn't seem like he's at that same sort of level he was at the Major. Yeah, so I, think, I think he actually at one point was like, if they, Worse than if they're that, gonna it was two and like Michael Lady, I think, was actually crazy. rocking the AWP again on the T side at least. I think Vox was getting in a very uh, dire position. So I don't really he see... He was on fire at one point in that game, though. He was more in a literal sense than uh, anything else. But, uh, That's how I want it. Yeah, I know. If they're going <laughs> to have any chance, sense. that was a really strong... Um, part of their game was Fox on the CT side of Inferno and I hope he can step up and bring that today but I'm not so sure after like the way they're in right now and obviously losing the Cyberzen on this map maybe this isn't one of their stronger ones anymore. The other aspect of that is again that the Inferno as well as yeah. most maps for Fnatic we discussed at the offset was T side has been their strongest suit so far this weekend so Fox is going to have to show up. Not only that, but uh, as you mentioned, if they couldn't, you know, if they had such a terrible T-side on cash, how they're going to play it on Inferno. 
I agree with that 100%. I think that cache is a, obviously a more open map. So there are things you can do, just run out mid, maybe go on the boost. Brute force just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or A main, something like that. On Inferno, you can't really do that. Where are you going to go? You have a lot of choke points, banana, uh, entrance to, to quad, mid, apps. Like, you need to have some sort of a plan, some a, a couple of executes, or at least uh, you need to know how you're going to get some map control, whether it's going to be mid, banana, or apps. And uh, I feel that if they're to have any chance, they need to start CT and have something ridiculous like 12 or 13 I rounds. Know, even if they start CT, I don't think that'll be enough. Yeah. I, think, I think they're going to lose their CT half pretty convincingly, if I'm honest. So I think starting T may be just so they can be a little bit more random and kind of like to stay as a wolf pack, try and just work some frags. Just get it out of the way, right? I just get the agony over I, I think <laughs> I think if they can win a pistol on T side and get a couple of rounds then maybe get five or six, they'll set themselves from a decent platform. I think it'll be too demoralizing starting on a CT half and getting wrecked. I think I'd rather start on T side if I was G2 right now. There's nothing at the moment from G2 to make the Fnatic guys worried. Like, even if Jacob had the odd round, they knew that wasn't going to be the whole round. He wasn't, wasn't going to drip 50 on them in a half. So the problem is, when you see Fnatic do badly against Envious and you think, oh, is there something wrong with Fnatic? The reason why I say it's a game within a game when the elite teams clash is because they have all the best players in general in those teams in terms of the stars. And so they know when things are going badly, it actually affects even the confidence of a Fnatic. When Envious is running Riot all over them, then they start to get worried like that. You see, when Fnatic loses a round to G2, they're not intimidated at all. No. And it's the other way around. When they start racking the rounds up, the reason they'll give one back every now and then is because they play so disrespectfully. Yeah. They're trying to actually humiliate you and intimidate you further to make you close down more, be more hesitant. And so G2 have to battle through that. They have to actually come forwards. And until they can really put on Fnatic, Fnatic aren't going to respect them in this season. They shouldn't at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I don't see that happening <laughs> in, on Inferno at all. Like, I don't think they're going to get the chance to earn that yeah. respect. I feel that it's going to be a I think it's all. going to be disrespect completely from Fnatic. They like, we've got Olaf and Crims towards the banana area. When they're in that kind of zone, especially when Olaf has arrived at the tournament, he's just going to be pushing down and just getting a map control every single time, forcing them out of there and making them like funnel towards middle. That's the thing. If anyone wants to see a model of Fnatic disrespecting an opponent on Inferno, go back to, I think, it was probably midsummer. I can't remember. I may have been ESWC. No, because Fnatic wasn't there. Yeah. Anyway, around that time, Fnatic played a game against Team Liquid with their old roster. It was 16-3, yeah. and Liquid couldn't even move. Okay, I think that might have been Gfinity Spring Masters 2, the one where it was the, the two six-team groups. It's possible. Yeah, it was yeah. somewhere around that time in the summer. But basically, every single time they tried to just get Banana established, all of a sudden, Fnatic was down middle. So it's possible that that's exactly what we see. Mm. Uh, obviously, we're all looking at the 2-0 at this point. There's no surprise. Let's get... A little more specific on score than what we expect um, to see. It depends. Like I said, I, I would actually rather start T side right now if I was G2, just so you could be a little bit looser to try some rushes, just try and be a, catch out the aggression, some of the disrespect coming in from Fnatic. I think they may... They'll probably be a very similar scoreline, 16-8 maybe. Uh, they, there may be some signs where if, if Jacob and AZ can carry on that form and get some big clutches going on, maybe they can do a little bit more. I think that, like I said, they were quite lucky before to get that close scoreline on cash. It was just Jacob, after losing the pistol, he stepped up and got those huge amount of frags and actually got them back into the game for four rounds before it fell apart. So mm -hmm. let's say 16-8, 16-9. But yep. uh, yeah, it's just going to be more of the same, in my opinion. Yeah, I agree that. I agree with that. I think it's going to be a walk in the park for Fnatic. They're probably going to just throw away a couple of rounds because of being, you know, uh, too disrespectful, maybe. So something around 16-6, 16-7 for Fnatic. Yeah, I definitely agree with that last point there. I, even though in paper, if they played perfectly at the current level they're at, Fnatic could thrash them completely. It's actually more likely they'll give up a few rounds just because it's yeah. going to be so easy. In general, I think if for G2, for them to have any chance, the guy I'd want to step up is going to be Rain. Because Inferno is a map where you can get plants, and once you have plants, you know if you use the architecture of the map very intelligently, you can win from a, a man disadvantage. And the guy to do that in this team obviously reigned historically. So he didn't play well in the first map. He hasn't been playing well recently since he had this switch up. Really. But if he can just play, if he can just turn, that, if he can get a couple of those key clutches, we saw what Envious did yesterday. When you when you have those those, those crazy clutches where you're losing the game otherwise, that could be the thing that could turn it. It won't though, and I think this will be a Fnatic 2-0. Yeah. Okay. I, well, I think that's that's basically what we're looking at. It's going to have to be an absolutely incredible and big turnaround for G2 if they want any chance of extending this series. Otherwise, their tournament ends right now. To find out, we do send it back over. DDK and James, please walk us through it. Hello, people. So it's uh, almost time to get into the second map here, which is going to be Inferno. So Henry thinks G2 needs to start on the T side to try some rushes and so on. But I think generally the way the, the team is going, they, need to, they, they, they have to start CT side first just to try and get as many rounds as possible because it seems quite clear to me that CT is where they're going to get rounds generally speaking, the way their team is playing at the moment. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I agree completely. And also because Fnatic have been, generally speaking, so solid um, on, their, on their CT sides in the way that they can take aggression, but also easily play advantages and it kind of exploit desperation. And desperation tends to happen quite a lot in Inferno for T sides. It's kind of the name of the game. Once you get all the smokes down, you keep re-smoking, you keep re-smoking. Sometimes your know, teams get into a spot where, and especially you know, a skill, you know, very high individual skill reliant uh, team like G2, you get into a spot where it's, it just gets frustrating because you just have to make a call at some point. Fnatic have successfully done one of the most important things in a competitive match, and that is to force the other team to a really hard decision. And uh, we'll have to see if they can indeed win that knife round and uh, start on the the preferred side. <laughs> Chris just running away there. Oh dear. Is he one of those, James? Crims is one of the, Look at him spinning around there. Crims Jackson. He's got he's got a he's got a method. There's a method to the madness. Oh okay, the madness sucks. <laughs> the madness sucks. I'm looking over to their booth. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think he's terribly fussed. But yeah. the, the thing is, I really think that at the moment G2 might be living and dying by knife rounds, so that is, yeah. is is huge. It's actually huge for G2. But now they have to deliver. I, I really think it's going to be super tricky for them to try and figure out how to um, adapt to Fnatic's CT side. I think we've seen good adaptation for most of the matches that we've seen from Fnatic where they've um, discerned weaknesses in teams and tried to exploit them, especially on this map with... Um, oh, who was it? I think it was... Was it Titan? I think it was Titan. And also much, much referring to, to be honest. Fnatic when they played Inferno, and they kept... Oh, never mind. We're into the pistol rounds. I'll come back to that later. Fnatic bombing up the uh, B area, it seems. Got a pop flash, but Rain's going to avoid it. Can he find a headshot, though? He is overwhelmed. He's not going to find any connections with his bullets. He's got uh, Fox in the sandbags, but he's dead as well. Jacob's going to get wrecked. So, despite winning the uh, knife, they don't look good for winning the pistol. And that could uh, give Fnatic a great, a great opportunity to break the C2 economy when they get the buy and really rack up some rounds. And if they do that, then I really fear for G2. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one. But they do have the potential here with AZ and Mike Melly. Oh, it's going to be hard. These setups and construction are hard enough to deal with. But they can't even get to that point. It would seem as Mike Lely will go down in the end to Olaf Meister at range. And the pistol round will be won by Fnatic. So G2 not really having a good start on either map. And I do, f I do fear for them here because G2 are the kind of team that are going to probably play more pressure buys, play more... Uh, kind of all in, uh, more of an all in kind of a style. And that's, when you're on the CT side, it can be very, very problematic to play that kind of a style. Because you need the grenades, James. James, you need grenades. Well, Fnatic are going to be up against a force buy. Fnatic took uh, one of their anti eco's, anti force buys pretty slowly on cash, which maybe wasn't the uh, best idea. This is perhaps a trickier map to get close to the sites with, to get close to the sites with uh, an anti eco or force buy on the, sorry, an eco or force by on the opposing team. So you can see Fnatic playing safety in numbers at the moment, but the flash doesn't come in and JW gets taken down for free. Yeah, it'd be a great round for GT to win to reset Fnatic straight away. And they've got a good start with it. And of course, AZ already on the AU AUMP. It's going to be useful, but it comes Fnatic. Four players moving together as a unit, looking to make those trades. Oh, what is this? These frags coming in here from G2 could be absolutely massive. As uh, two, in fact, three players left there for G2. AZ coming in at the last moment with that UMP to completely gut the offense of the Swedish side. And that will be indeed the immediate reset. But Fnatic will likely force by in this position. Uh, right back, so it's not over just yet. The Madness, the Anarchy, and the Bedlam will all continue in this round. I mean, it, was, it wasn't a good start for Fnatic when they had JW top mid, waiting for the smoke to disappear, peeking towards short, but nobody covering him from long. Got taken down absolutely for free, no trade frag, and it just fell apart from there. Got Molotov to push Fox off the angle, but AZ is going to get the first frag onto Olaf Meister. Taken down by JW, however. We'll see if he's able to pick up that M4. I think he probably will team heading in that, in that direction at the moment. And now uh, we've got Makaleli moving towards the pit position from the site, and it's really important he holds pit should Fnatic move towards the A site. They've got the bomb and the rest of the players going in that direction, so it seems likely that they'll be headed his way pretty soon. We've got uh, Jekin playing the pit, sorry, the uh, sandbags with the P90 over towards B, and G2 is slowly going to put 
Fox on Speedway with the UMP, so he can have a quick rotation towards Arch should he need to. Counter flash is coming in from the pit. Fnatic still holding for now. Yeah, they are indeed, and uh, it's all coming to a boiling point, though. This push finally is going to be arriving. Fox goes for the challenge. He's going to lose the battle against Flusher. That's going to allow a lot of space for Fnatic to move in, and more options as well, but Flusher doesn't even need options. He's just going to find bullets to these players of G2, and there's going to be another frag there going the way of Fnatic. G2 in a desperate situation, relying on just Jaken with the P90, and yeah, sure, he's an amazing P90 player, but he hasn't even got a kit at the moment, and he, you know, he's one versus four. So he's looking to just try to save this weapon, and he can't even get a frag as he falls back, and Fnatic probably not interested really in challenging him, as they're all very low on HP, and uh, he does have a P90, so they would be right for the pickings for Jacob if they did challenge him. What can be really dangerous for G2 here is we're in a situation where we're early on and both teams continue to trade rounds back and forth, one round one, one round run. We can continue to see force buys from both teams for quite a while. But if they continue to trade like this, then that's not going to be favorable for G2. And Jacob finally goes down. So the question now is, are G2 going to go for the force buy here, knowing that the economy is still going to be low for the T side? Because if they do, then that could put them pretty badly on the back foot going forward on their CT side, which is the key side for them. Yeah, it is definitely a key side for them. Fnatic uh, looking to rock G2 straight back. And again, you know, the Vandis will never cease. Indeed, they have gone for the fourth fight. You can see $50 only in the bank for multiple players of G2 here. And they, they, they have to do it, basically. They just have to keep doing this until... Uh, one of these teams strings to, you know, two rounds together. We'll just continually see these force buys. And who is it going to be? You know, I do have a good feeling for Fnatic now. They've got uh, a decent amount of grenades to try to push on these positions, but they are wary that G2 could go for some aggression. Speaking well, of grenades, there's only one smoke, and that's it on G2 with a minute 30 on the clock here. That's not a good sign. Yeah, the force buy is not conducive to lots of nades, unfortunately, for G2. And now Fnatic are starting to make their way. And they've cleared the bedroom with the uh, Molotov there from Crims in second and middle. And they have pushed a player in there as well. It is actually Olaf Meister. And they're going to leave him actually in Boiler. So this is going to be that classic B play with Olaf Meister as the lurker. And this we've seen this so many times from Fnatic. And it is very strong. Yeah, you can see Flusher waiting for the CT to look for some information. They're playing so passively on B and A that G2 will have no idea where this push is coming until perhaps it is too late. Got many Fnatic players now just holding formation towards B, and Fox is starting to move away as Fnatic set up for these nades. So Jacob's going to be isolated on the site unless Fox can get back in quickly. Again, no nades whatsoever now for the CT side. Seemingly waiting for a reaction but there's a massive flank Olaf Meister in CT spawn and uh, somehow they've missed that and that's going to be a massive problem for G2 yeah here we go we got uh, G2 with those three players left alive they can't really do much with this they're going to have to save these uh, these these force bought weapons these deagles and the Kevlar that they have and try to do some damage in the next round but it would appear that Fnatic have won the battle the tug of war has been won by the Swedish side and that does not bode well for G2 that was so sneaky, even we didn't see it. I don't know how Olaf Meister managed to get through Arch all the way into uh, CT spawn there, but indeed he did. And that means Fnatic take the uh, site without losing a single player. There's a bit of a hunt for these CTs, as you can see on their minimap, trying to save what they can. And again, now uh, Fnatic string their second round together. G2 thinks can survive with three players, at least they, that would be something. They've got some full armor and some dangerous pistols, but I mean, look at their economy. They've got about $2,000 per person. So it's not an amazing situation. So it's funny that now they've put the, uh, they've put the money situation on top of the floaty cam, but they're showing us play cam instead, so we still can't see to buy that. Yeah, it's going to be pretty awful for GT. I don't that mean they, sh they should be on a uh, safe. And uh, indeed. They've got the three pistols that they saved, as well as the two other players who didn't spend any money. And here's a quick push coming in from Fnatic, the anti-eco play. JW opening things up with nice entries. And it's Rain there, close with the CZ. Can he get some damage in here? He might just get a lot of damage. There's a double spray with that CZ. And that could actually help out, but it's Flusher lurking around CT spawn. That's really going to stop this effort. But AZ has a chance here. He has got half health. 
But Dennis is one bullet away from death, and Hazy survives the flames with one HP, and now he's moving through the smoke. This guy has balls of steel, but he's not going to pull this round out of the bag. It's going to go to Fnatic. 4-1 now the score. There seems to be a backdoor into CT spawn for Fnatic at the moment. Now we're seeing, I think we're seeing a buy. We'll find out in a few seconds. For G2, they need to close that door wherever it lies because um, Fnatic already had a significant advantage on their T side, which can, is a problem that can only grow worse for G2 and could lead them to uh, a quick 0-2 defeat. In fact, they're going to have two people over towards Arch in this round, Makalele and Rain. Of course, you've got Fox over towards B, holding the angle with the Orp. Flusher is by the tree position. They all know what to expect from G2 towards the banana area. We'll see later on if they are able to uh, defend it. There's only, two fl there's only three flashbangs on the Fnatic side, and Flusher has none of those, and indeed he'll get taken down by Fox towards the tree position. Yeah, it's a nice setup here from G2. Two players towards Arch side. Although they, they will actually fall back with Rain onto the bomb site now. As they await the push from Fnatic, Fnatic have uh, enough nades still to get the uh, nice little set play onto the A bomb site. Now we do have Michael Allen at the uh, spot there on Arch side. And G2 playing two players at top of Banana. They do need to rotate somebody uh, soon or go for an information play to actually figure out that they can play four players onto the A bomb site in this position. And here come the nades. That's going to be the telegraph for the G2 side, but still they hold their positions. Fnatic playing this slow, and there's the first engagement. There is the rotation now for G2. Will Fnatic commit onto the bomb site? Looks like they are going for it. Two players on the site. This is going to be tough here for G2 to hold. It's going to be very tough indeed. Rain with a good start though. AZ's gone down, just down to Rain. Rain gets taken out, and that's a free open bomb site for Fnatic. Bomb's going to get planted. They've got one player CT, one player coming from top mid do the uh, G2 side. Again, that extra time on the clock, but neither of these two players have a defuse kit. There should be one on the side somewhere. That is a great shot from Fox onto JW. Now they need to find out where these last two players are playing. And there's a crossfire between the pit and the site, although Olaf Meister might get isolated in a battle with Jacob here. So there's still something for the CTs to do, but again, they'll still need to find a kit. Down goes Crims, down to Olaf Meister in the pit now, leaving it into a one versus one. And the clock is ticking on Fox, and he may have to make a run for it. Olaf Meister reading this, is going to go for the peak and finish him off. No money left here for G2 on their buy, absolutely ruined. And one of the biggest issues for G2 is how they're playing the A bomb site. They're playing it so deep, they have no information. By the time Fnatic get up to the site, it's too late. They can't, they can't uh, play on the information they have because Fnatic are in their faces. And you saw the. You saw G2 trying to play the counter flash situation, McLeary holding the arch angle with, uh, I think it was Dennis, no, not, De not Dennis. Um, it was maybe AZ throwing flashes onto the roof there, but it came in too late. McLeary got, got taken down regardless. There's nobody to trade for the CT side. 5 1 to Fnatic, G2 back on the eco. This is a disaster. Yeah, it really is. It really is a disaster. Now we'll have uh, Olaf with the first frag onto Michael Ailey, and again, there's nothing really to speak of for G2. But this is starting to look a little, a little bit stompy. Uh, it's flat to just play their anti eco. They, they've got the kills they need towards A, so they're just going to make their way towards A. Couldn't really be more simple than that. Of course, there can still be, uh, you know, players on the bomb site if there was a stack. But now the number advantage is such that Fnatic don't need to fear it. You know, any kind of a stack or anything like that. So, should be game over here, and that'll be a six-one scoreline. G2, they might as well try and uh, get some exits going on for themselves. But they're playing it pretty passively, actually. It's like it's going to be Olaf Meister picking up the exit kills as he exits the library. And uh, G2, we, I would really like to see you know, Fox able to pick up that AWP and start you know, roaming the map with it, you know, getting some aggressions, going in the apartments, going in middle, going into uh, Banana, because they can't just sit and wait and let Fnatic play their game. Looking, looking back at um, Cluj, that's kind of the tournament where G2 made adjustments, you know, and it's one of those situations where people aren't so sure what to expect from them and they're not used to their approach. The same way you saw Cloud9 performance at Valencia. You know, you have that breakout, breakout event, but then when, when that happens and people adjust to you and they're used to what to expect from you, then, then you really find out how good a team you are. So perhaps that's what we're seeing right now. Oh, G2 uh, at the major as well, in those... Uh, all those series that they played so well after making out the group stages, 
they had like three or four players and every single game on absolute fire. Yeah. And we haven't really seen that from them since that tournament. Here you go, here's the fast push coming in from Fnatic. Fox is really pushed to an awkward position here, getting close to his teammate, he gets one frag, can't get the second one, and his teammate Jcam is gonna get traded immediately. That setup was completely busted down by the sheer ridiculousness of that pace from Fnatic. The Swedes have dominated the banana area, and now they dare dominate the B bomb side as well with the uh, plant. But three versus three, there is hope here for G2, but can they make it happen? There is, uh, you can jump on the well, in CT spawn to look into that door area, but the smoke is not going to help in that situation. JW taking down Makalele, and now we have Rain and AZ. They're stuck in construction. They can't even run away because of where they are. And there we go, they're getting finished off again. This is uh, cruelty at this point, Dan. Yeah, it's obscene. And battery. It is obscene. And uh, it does seem like G2 is starting to feel very kind of drained by the fact that they can't find the right path to walk. They can't see which direction to go against Fnatic. Well, they can't. They can't. Con they're unable to control the rounds. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's and again, like I, I mentioned before, I want to see Fox able to try to do something aggressively. But that was the perfect round for Fnatic to just turn up the pace on the B bomb side. They completely caught them out of position. And now we're, we're basically seeing what we've seen so often: another quasi buy, another awful situation on the money for G2. Yeah, so this this should this round should be about damage and damage only for G2, like trying to get some damage in, doing what they can. And uh, they've made a gamble towards the A site. There's no commitment from Fnatic either way just yet. You can see Jacob heading back over towards the B bomb site. You do wonder in this situation if it's worth the uh, CT splitting up one by one like that, with Jacob over towards B, or if it's worth him just holding the gamble towards one site concentrating their efforts in one place they can trade, cause a bit of bedlam for mayhem. Taking that all off by, so that seems to be it for now. We've got Makalele being uh, eliminated. And there we go, they're all dying one by one in a round where they've only got pistols. Yeah, it's not uh, the best situation in the world. So eight rounds already for the T-side of Fnatic. And it's hard to be inspired by G2 in their play at the moment. Because again, you know, on the CT side, well, on the T side, it's a little bit easier to try to say, okay, you know, what solution can we find against the defense? You know, what's been working? What's strong for the opposition? You know, what's what are our strengths? You know, you, you can kind of dictate the rounds much more easily, easily based on what you're working with as well. But on the CT side, especially on a map like this, it's hard to actually do much other than react unless you have a big buy, which has been a problem for G2. And they have a big buy now. We've got AZ moving into the apartments. Fox is uh, towards the B bomb site with Jacob. And uh, Fnatic are going to be taking over apartments. So they're Fnatic playing a default round here. Can G2 get something going for them? AZ did some right damage actually with that uh, nade onto Dennis from the balcony. Rather than going for a risky pick there, because you can often find someone holding an angle uh, from early T apps through the window. So rather than showing himself, just bounces a nade off the wall there, which is a nice touch. But of course, G2 will need more than that. So you can see they're, they're playing with a bit more aggression towards top mid now, with uh, Rain coming to join Makalele, whereas before they were playing so passively, again, they were left in a situation where they had no information and Fnatic would be all over them by the time they realized what's going on, unable to react, unable to do what they want, just playing to the uh, tune of Fnatic's flute. Now we're seeing Fnatic breach top mid, and that's going to cause two G2 players on R to try and reposition Rain with a bit of shoulder picking that we saw from Flusher as well. And you look how, how the Fnatic uh, players are working together. Two players coming in through to CT Spawn to take down Rain. Again, CT Spawn's been compromised for the nth time by Fnatic, which means a B split is very likely here. Yeah, this is a really rough situation. Oh, you can see JK, he wants to try to get some information as to what's going on. Doesn't have a flash from a teammate or anything to work with, just walks out and gets completely wrecked. AZ's on the pit position, that's great, he, but he's isolated, he's alone, he's going to get himself another kill there. So AZ's doing some good damage, but again, he's alone, and his teammates are already pretty much down and out for the count in this round, leaving Fox in a one versus three on a retake situation, and honestly, it's it's quite, it's not impossible, of course, but it would take a misplay out of Fnatic for them to give this round away, and obviously Fox realizes that situation is just going to try to save around libraries, so. It's an interesting call 
from Fnatic to uh, they had two two guys deep into CT spawn and three on Banana in front of the B bomb site, but they chose to go to A to try and catch the uh, CTs out of position in a rotation. G2 though was still in the pit at the time, um, but it's worked out regardless. But I like it. Fnatic are they're thinking about every step, which is great to see for them. They're going, if they prove successful going forward here, then they're going to have uh, tougher challenges ahead. So it's nice to see them on point, but G2 left guessing at every every moment. And again, Fnatic have just got into CT spawn so many times in this match so far. Absolutely, they've they've had free reign, absolute free reign. And this is uh, this is gonna be a really nice match for for them to uh, to be playing like this on the stage as well, because uh, you know go, they, the way that they started this tournament, to be honest, was pretty awful. But they've started to hit their form. They're starting to, to peak at the right timing. And here's the fast play coming in from G2. Finally trying to meet force with force. Jumping their way down towards the bottom of Banana and claiming it. Now, three players there for Fnatic. This might be the first time we've seen them at early round with such a disadvantage. Now, G2 just have to hold this advantage. They just have to play it safe from this point forward. You've got Michael Lely there deep on Banana. He's able to s uh, spot if there's aggression. He's got to be careful though that he's not too far forward here because if Fnatic decide to rush, and they could very well do so. I mean, they, in fact, they will. He could get caught out. He's going to go for the shot. Say. He doesn't need to take these risks and he's going to go down for free. Yeah, he couldn't get around the corner fast enough. That's going to leave Jacob trying to duel. Getting sprayed through the smoke. He's going to have to be really careful about peeking. Fnatic have been very good at finding the right angles through the smokes in this tournament so far. Got a reasonable rotation coming in here for G2. There's still a lurker and Olofmeister towards top mid, so we'll have to pay attention and see if he can make it towards CT Spawn. He's headed that way. Got a play coming in his direction though, and Rain will hold things down here. But what is the read from G2? They take down Olofmeister top mid. They don't know where the remaining two players are. There was a bit of action towards Banana, but the rotation is possible now because Fnatic have been quite silent over there. Indeed. Molotov down there onto AZ's position by CT Spawn and Spray coming in wildly from JKM. He only finds, in fact, doesn't find any targets. It's AZ who gets it. Crims down one versus two. He spot the next player, goes for the engagement, almost gets the kill. Very close indeed, but no dice. G2 will survive, but they lost a lot of players there. And I feel like Michael Lele, you know, he took a massive risk. His, his positioning was pretty awful, knowing that they, he was being rushed. He wanted to go for the kill, despite the fact that his team was still with five players left alive, and it should have been impossible for them to push a bomb site uh, without uh, and, and to get more than one kill. To be honest, so Fox still on the AWP. Grenades looking okay for G2. Yeah, they've still got a worse fire than the Fnatic at the moment. Putting a third person over towards B initially, but. There's no early rush. Fnatic avoiding the grenades over there. There's only two smokes left on the uh, CT side, but McLeary taking Crimson is a good start. Fox, though, is going to be eliminated towards B, towards A apps. So G2 has tried to uh, mix things up there. Fox going JW style, but Fnatic will be the kings of that. Yeah, four versus four is uh, often poor, a poor situation for the uh, CT side and. Do they go for a gamble? Do they try to put three players on one site or do they split two, two and two? Usually the T's in this spot will wait for quite a while if they have the time. Because usually if you wait long enough, the, T, the CTs will actually go and, and they actually will split two to a site because they just have, don't have any information. And that's sort of happening to this point actually now as uh, G2 have uh, one player on the site itself and uh, Michael is in spawn. And here comes the push. This could be a one versus four here for the guy on the side. That's AZ. He's just standing on first oranges. He's going to go down after one frag. Michael Lane now comes in, gets eliminated with no return. And that should be a wrap in this round, unless JKM gets something ridiculous. But the bomb is down and Fnatic have position. And they have an AWP as well. So I don't know if there's a smoke down between CT and the site, but we'll soon find out. Again, I think we had. Uh, Rain jumping on the well, as I mentioned earlier, you can see into the doorway there through to construction, which can take people by surprise, but no engagements there. And once again, G2 going to have to run away with the tail between their legs. So I think their economy is going to be uh, in the doldrums once again. Unfortunately, I don't think we have contact with the observer. He's probably connected to the uh, Russian speaking car, so we can't bring up the scoreboard on request. Wow, that is beautiful, absolutely stunning stuff. Yeah, very nice crowd here.
So G2 now, they are only with two <laughs> rounds at the moment. Matic are walking all over them. And this is uh, this is definitely uh, quite a struggle. We will see if Fox with the Orbi goes for the push. He doesn't connect the shot. Again, it was a good opportunity there. A couple of players on the screen. And he's going to be careful not to get caught too heavily out of position. AZ's going to make some stuff happen by partners. AZ has been pretty good in this series so far, as Olaf Meister is going to finally remove him from the app's position. The bomb was spotted, though, and that's actually going to cause a bit of a rotation. And uh, JK will, will uh, assist the A-bomb side as he moves in for the three-man defense. Oh, there's Krieg, man. Krieg too strong. I love that Krims has bought the Sid Krieg. Three versus four now as G2 struggle to hold this bomb site. And the struggle is going to continue. Krims back in with another frag here. The Krieg is doing excellent damage. Flusher will finish off JK. Now it's Michael Ellie with the Mag 7. Don't, don't think this is going to happen for him though. He might be able to pick up a weapon perhaps. That's pretty much best case. Yeah, dire straits for G2. And you have to wonder what, where they are mentally in this match at the moment because I think it would be hard for them not to think, oh, okay, we're going to lose this match. Yeah. Right, but then you need to you need to keep your composure. It's not over until it's over. Maybe the uh, freedom of the T side will end up being better for them overall. I mean, in hindsight, it's easy to say. But how many rounds are they going to go into the second half with to to be able to mount an offense? Obviously, they're not winning the Angels at the moment. They don't really have the equipment to do that, as evidenced by Makalele's Mag Seven. But once they get onto the AKs on the T side. Maybe uh, just going for the raw jewels will be more beneficial to them. But then if Fnatic are playing in the positions on the A site that where they've, we've seen them play on previous matches here on Inferno in this tournament, then I think G2 might really struggle to deal with that. But we are into the dying rounds of the first half before we get there. And again, King Gwyn on the G2 on the force buy. They've got one shotgun and four sets of pistols here. Quite a reasonable amount of grenades. See, they've tried to force their way. Wait a minute, what's going on here? Flusher takes down Fox. Got to get traded by Jacob, and that might put an end to this. Or looks like they're going to force the issue. GW going to not see Jacob in the corner, but he's eventually going to go down as well. So, quite expensive round for both teams so far. But again, Fnatic are in a situation where they can perhaps try to uh, dispose of those weapons over the fence before they continue their march. Yeah, it's a bit chaotic here. So if we look at this situation, we've got three versus three. And uh, Fnatic, they don't have any control up banana. They don't have apps. They don't have middle just yet. You know, the op but the the, uh, the best options are from this spot where you can trade the most, uh, uh, the best is probably banana and, and middle. So and they're actually going to be picking middle here. They've got they've got Solof Meister with 20 HP moving up towards the apartment side. So it's a lots of points in which G2 can be hiding here. More so than the banana area, which is you just have to look forwards, but you have to look left and right in a lot of spots. And Rain, oh, he's going to go just for the push, just at the right moment. And he's going to spot one player. There's the headshot onto Crimson's, the, re the immediate return from Dennis, but he's going to uh, pump up the pace now as he finds Michael Lennon. The spray is not good enough. So, how on earth did Michael Lennon connect a headshot there with that Mag 7? Oh, can't quite pull the trigger in time. Olaf Meister was very low, 20 HP, but AZ can still do this one. But no! Denied! Olaf Meister somehow, instant headshot. See you later. No Mag 7 for I you. Th I think AZ needed one shot with that 5-7 to the chest to yep. take that round. But Olof Meister, 20 HP. He is going nuclear versus G2 at the moment. Great play by him. Can't get over how sexy the stage is. Yeah, I know, we've seen it so many times. For yeah. a little bit too long. Triple Mag 7, not every day you see this, not even in Oceania. Would you see Triple Max 7? You might see Triple Law, but not Triple Max 7. <laughs> yeah, indeed. JW gets a quick kill there in uh, middle, so already Fnatic start things off with a nice nice uh, advantage. And you know, he just caught some aggression. You know, G2 just trying to make stuff happen, trying to force the uh, square piece into the circle into the circle hole, and it's not quite going their way. Now, JW with another pick. This is just heinous right, th right now because he's just a one-man army. Dennis picks up a kill by by the banana side as well, and oh, things aren't looking too good for him, but Jacob at least gets something done with the mag. 
And there you go. Round's over before you know it, and that's 32 first half. But that's that's T rounds for Fnatic. That's that's so scary. They're so good on the CT side as well. I feel like both halves or both both first halves of these two maps sh should have seen a 13-2 score to be honest. Well there we go. It's funny actually, again, you know, we have the the Russian commentary in the arena, we're kind of uh, uh, almost third party to it. And it reminds me of all the uh, uh, back back in the old StarCraft days when Tasis first went to Korea. Because you'd always you would always see him in that situation. That was always very interesting to get an insight into that culture and uh, you know, we're getting to see some wonderful things here in Minsk amongst a lot of snow. Most importantly a wonderful crowd that's Pistol turned up to the arena. Time. G2 not off to a good start there. Olaf Meister's gonna get traded on banana, but uh, there's a bit of baiting going on there. You can see JW is behind the sandbags, so or he's not going to wait around. He could take down the bomb here. The bomb's on his own on Banana, and he's going to lose the jewel. The bomb's lost on Banana for the uh, T side. Makalele finds himself on the A site. What a disaster. Oh, my God. It's not good, James. It's not looking good. This is a slaughter at the moment. Fnatic have just gone Super Saiyan on G2. G2 just cannot, cannot comprehend what's going on. 42, I mean, again, it's the spot where we, saw, we actually saw a similar spot on the, the last map uh, where, you know, G2 had to win a force buy. Again, it's, you know, not out of the question for them to do that. And it does put them in a good spot economically, but they just need rounds. They need rounds more than anything. So let's see how they decide to approach this. They've got what, to win this round. I think what they might need at this point is to be put out of their misery. The knaves are flying in. The P90s are coming in as well. And that round's over faster than I can even talk. That was really anticlimactic, James. That was over faster than you can microwave a pot noodle, Dan. <laughs> Man, that brings me back to my uni days. Days of the pot noodle. So 15-2, Fnatic on match points. G2 about to be eliminated from the Star Series 14. Grand finals here from the mint screen. And look at this. Fnatic want to finish it in a very dominant way. As they just charge down middle, they charge down Banana, the P90's in, the spray's coming out. Olaf Weiss with two, Deagle in play, but actually a two on two now in the chaos. So G2 can maybe scrape together a round here now. Fox heavily tagged, JW heavily tagged. Weapon advantage has to be with the uh, CTs here. Fox is unfortunately going to miss both of them, but maybe he hears JW in construction. He's going to be much quicker on the trigger here. So live with 6 HP and he'll, he will be a problem. Rain has a lot of time here, so he doesn't need to go for a bomb plant anytime soon. Doesn't have the range with the P90, switches to the Deagle, and Fnatic finish what they started. G2 gets stomped into the mud. That's like some Arvind, Ivan Drago business. If he dies, he dies, and G2 certainly did in this match. So we've got Stepan and Sue on the stage. And I think our glorious host Smix will be going for an interview with one of these players. Smix actually has done a humongous amount of research oh yeah, on it's all unreal. of these teams. For those of you who are unfamiliar with her, trust me, she is an absolute boss. And we are fortunate to have her within our scene. Yeah, I, I echo that completely. It's, I have been incredibly impressed, but here they are on the stage with Dennis. I love Stefan. I think that we are enjoying this game and uh, it was incredible. So, right now, I'm let me introduce Smix and Dennis. Uh, guys, how are you? Hello. Thank you very much, Stefan, and congratulations, Dennis. After a sort of a rough start to your first day here, you guys are able to redeem yourselves with a really convincing 2-0 victory over Gamers 2. You guys just seem to be in really good condition. How is it from your perspective? Yeah, I think we are. Um, I, we 
play very well right now, so yeah. <laughs> I want to talk about Cash uh, first. I know that that is Gamers 2's one of their best maps, but actually, you guys have played Gamers 2 on Cash pretty much recently. It was actually in the Star Series European qualifiers. You beat them 16 1, so I'm wondering if because of that, you guys felt more comfortable and confident heading into that first map. Yeah, and because I played with them before, so I know, I know pretty much how they play. So that's really interesting. Can you explain and talk about that a little bit more? Uh, playing against a team that you were a part of before, I'm sure there's a lot of things that you know because obviously there's so much you learn from playing with the team. So how much of that do you actually share and talk about with Fnatic before the game? Uh, before the game, I say everything what they usually do. So yeah, I say everything that I know. And let's talk about Flusha in-game leading. I was able to speak with JW a little bit about it yesterday, and he said that uh, they struggle a little bit because sometimes you guys don't listen to Flusha when you should. You guys listen 20 or 30 seconds later. So do you also do that? Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> it's like uh, when, we have, when you have a plan in your head, then you don't listen. You just do it. <laughs> Well, your next opponent is going to be Luminosity in the semifinals. And you know your team has played Luminosity many times in the past. Most recently, it was actually at the face at Stage 3 finals, where they took you to three maps uh, in the finals. And before that, at Kaluj, they actually took a map off of you guys. So wondering how you guys feel about headed against Luminosity. It's going to be fun. They are hard to play. But I think we will win 2-0 this time. Oh, wow, 2-0. That's a lot of confidence. Even after the games that they had against 2-0, against Navi and Gamers 2, you're that confident. Yeah, I am. <laughs> All right, then. Fair enough. Well, congratulations on making it to the semifinals. And of course, it will be Fnatic going up against Luminosity in the semifinals. So stay tuned, guys. Lines 2011 года. Реферальная система для постоянных пользователей и бонус на первый депозит. Магазин игровых девайсов и лучший выбор платежных систем. Dota 2 и Hearthstone, Counter-Strike и StarCraft, World of Tanks и Лига Легенд. EGB.com. Ты точно знаешь, кто победит. Вы получили запасные коды или другие цифровые продукты? Есть место, где вы можете продать их менее чем за одну минуту. Смотрите, перейдите на g2a.com. Нажмите «Начните продавать». Быстрая регистрация. Перейдите к «Мой аккаунт» и нажмите «Продажа». «Продать продукт». Введите название, код, цену. И готово. g2a.com. Цифровая торговая площадка. Упрощенная глобальная продажа. Есть лишние скины? Хочешь выиграть реально крутые вещи? Заходи на ksgofast.ru, делай свои ставки и выигрывай реально крутые скины. ksgofast.ru. Проверь свою удачу. Thankfully, the Score Esports advertisement is in English because that's the only one I understood. And speaking of apps, I actually downloaded one halfway through that game that predicts the future. I asked about G2's chances as a team, and this is all it's been showing me for the last half hour. I, I don't understand why. Do you want us to finish it off? Yeah, or? please. Tell me why, guys. <laughs> yeah, lighting a candle okay. for G2, I think. Is that the okay, that was oh, the, was joke, that the joke. joke. Oh, I, right. I meant to elaborate that's the on the joke. Okay. So actually, here's the thing about this <laughs> game. I'll set the theme for what happened in, in this second game and the series overall. So okay, Olaf Meister is the king of CS:GO, obviously. Okay, so yeah. he's got he's got the kind of the blue button, the the prestige, the the kind of the, the you know who he is. He, he's up, upper class. Uh, JW, I heard in that game had like a little bugle, like because it was fox hunting time, guys. I didn't know that was what I thought it was CS, but fox hunting. That's the spot we were all in there because man alive, that guy got wrecked over this series. And yeah. overall, G2 as a team. Very, very underwhelming. Yeah, it, it started off badly for them. The pistol run comes in. We said um, if. Well, I actually said that I'd prefer them to start on the T side. They got the CT side, normally the, the more favoured side, but when you're losing 13-2 on your CT side of Inferno, you've got to ask yourself some serious questions there. Fnatic come in, they just do a straight-up B rush on the pistol there, and there seems to be some signs of life. G2 come back and win the second round force by there. It's kind of down to Fnatic showing a little bit of disrespect. I think they had four SMGs on their second round. That can work, but it's normally kind of... Uh, 
you don't really want to do that against CTs that are forced up with the CZ and armor. It's not really that effective. So they bounce back, but then all of a sudden, Fnatic come to life, and it's just a complete wrecking machine. They stay together. They have very good fundamentals. It wasn't so much as a tactical approach. They just traded very well in the, the certain, certain scenarios, just smoking off towards Arch, staying together onto the bomb sides, making sure anyone who went down, it was answered back straight away. And as I kind of predicted, Fox did pick up the AWP. One of the first frags into the game, he gets the first frag down towards middle, and then they can't even, like, they, they try to adjust and try to make their setup effective, and then it's getting picked off every single place. I think Fox finished on four frags in the end, and he was the CT player who said he had to go big in this so I have series. To, I have to point this out again, because AZ curse continues, and I don't know why it's a curse, because he's the new boy. They've sucked ever since they got him. I'm not going to use any other adjective. And again, he's the only one that's even showing up in the frag chart. Well, it says Tim and Jacob again. Like the other three guys were just like didn't so even come onto the server For AZ, this is like you were in prison, okay? And you'd been working out in prison, and you'd been like writing a few repeal, and you'd, you'd gotten a few degrees while you were in there. And you're like, if I ever get out of prison, right, you know, yeah. I'm going to be really successful in the real world. And someone was like, oh, come on. We're going to move you, actually. We, you're getting out of prison, mate. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, you get in the, the truck. You go along and they go, welcome to this brand new, top quality, high security prison. You're back in prison. They go, oh, <laughs> what is this? I thought I was out of prison. Oh, I take it back. Okay, there's And the also, speaking of being in prison, stuff. it looked a bit like a G2 was in prison with How? the way that was going. Map best performance. Michael Edwards. I, I, yeah, kill. so apparently that the other, the other one was combined, but where it was 13 kills combined oh, see, for so AZ, right. you can <laughs> see why <laughs> I was misled. <laughs> okay. So this is, just, this is just Inferno now, right? Yeah. So Michael ellie has got... A map best performance with six kills. Um, <laughs> <laughs> nice reading it? skills right there. <laughs> Good eyes, Henry. Well, is that, is that, what did it say? <laughs> no, that was correct. <laughs> I was just <laughs> clapping because that's a know, fantastic just, total. That's, I'm you, saying, you know I'm, I'm surprised that's, he's actually I'm, I'm making the point. three times more rounds than his team won, so obviously that's impressive. I'm just trying to surprise you make it to a top five on the server with six kills. <laughs> that was pretty I don't know. Pretty yeah, that, that chart did The thing is, earlier in, early in the broadcast, we did reference when we were talking about Inferno. Okay, you see teams like Envious win the T side of Inferno sometimes. That's because they're the best T-Side teams in the world. Do not, if you're a new watcher to CSGO, imagine that this was in any way reasonable. If someone tells you it's going to be a 16 to an Inferno, you are automatically going to say, right, they must have started CT, must have been a fantastic half. You very rarely even see 16 twos from teams who start CT yeah. half. When you get absolutely battered like that on your CT half, you have no business being on an, an Inferno game right there. I mean, the most humiliating round of all for me was when those two guys from G2 got caught behind the sandbags. Oh, One God. had an AWP and wasn't... Like if you have the op there, the whole point of that, you, you lock down the distance. You're not hiding behind the sandbags with another you're, guy. You're on the corner. You're trying to get the distraction for the guy that's in sandbags. Fox went for, okay, I'll jump in with you with the, the AWP towards sandbags. He managed to get one kill, but it's just such a mess going on there. It seems like the communication, the synergy's not there. Everything that could have gone possibly wrong for G2 there happened. Every single clutch and every single situation that's just seemed like to go against that, them. That whole play is like the guy that like the bear's chasing. One guy hides, and he just comes and hides right next to the other guy, and the other guy's like, what are you doing? What? The bear's going to get us both now. Like, yeah. I think why? that's a Canadian story there. Like, <laughs> the, I haven't had a lot of experience <laughs> running away from bears. Like, oh, this is my spot. You know the etiquette of bear chasing. <laughs> <laughs> you never hide where your mate's hiding. Hey, bear I saw, code. Of the 8,000 people here today, I saw one guy that was wearing a Canadian hat. Thing so is, though, usually you guy. chase after bears. You don't uh, run away from them, right? That's Although why I apparently, after Henry bears do like twinks, I've heard. <laughs> I have so. no response. I have no response. Okay. Yanko, save me. This is what you're here for every single time. I just feel sorry for the CyberZen guys because they came, me. Okay, they came here all the way from China. They performed reasonably well. They, they, they're thinking right now, we did good. We, we took a map of, from a top EU team. We were, we were so close to beating them, actually, but uh, it turns out that they're not that good, actually, and that will <laughs> now, you know, make I their success <laughs> not as great I like the as way they I thought, I thought it was going to be because they deserve the chance yeah, to no, no, play no, in the next with. game, not I thought G2. It was, I thought it was, it, it was depressing enough, you know, that G2 got wrecked, that Fnatic didn't even have to play properly. <laughs> Jankel found, like, a new level of despair from his Eastern European background. He's like, but think of poor CyberZen. One tear running down their eyes. I thought we played well. <laughs> Man alive, Yanko. That's dark right there. I literally Man thought alive. he was going to say it because I feel like CyberZen yeah. deserved the chance to play in this game instead. Yeah. And, and the Real Belarus. I don't, th in terms of like the analysis of this game, there's not really much we can take away from it, I think. I've, I started well, taking I mean, notes. Olaf back on form. Well, no, that, that's the great thing. Good. That's yeah, the yeah. fantastic thing. They're back in this tournament. They yeah. found their full form. Olaf Meister has arrived. And uh, I just, I was taking some detailed notes for about the first six rounds that I realized it's probably worth my time just going and being on Tinder or something instead of actually <laughs> watching the game. As I actually go, if you well, get Fox, just yeah. swipe the other way on that one, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's not super a good match, match for anyone. No, I'd match. probably uninstall the app to make sure it doesn't it, get There should be a super dislike button. Yeah, Super dislike. 
you have to pay a bit, but it's worth it. You get five of them a day. So, <laughs> super dislike. Yeah, and you could use all five on G2 players, actually. It actually just matter. IP bans him from being able to contact you even. Okay, let's. Uh, we've got a, There's our schedule. Oh, obviously, love a bit up. of Delta. Well, we've got Alliance in secret. Why yeah. wouldn't we? I mean, you hear on the Russian stream as you Hopefully. saw from the commercials. So get ready for better. I mean, better, better Delta. I think the Alliance secret game could be a really good game as long as Loda doesn't choke. That's the only thing we have to watch out for there. Uh, but you know. you know, if that happens, then we could be right back into CS just really quickly with question mark and Navi. So that's the good news. We are going to go back now. Before we do jump away from this stream and get there, we'll preview that game when the time comes. Yes. Let's jump to tomorrow with Fnatic yeah. revitalized a little bit. They're going to be going against Luminosity, who had an awesome group stage. Where do we kind of see that game? Shaping this up. is obviously, in terms of the historical narrative, a rematch of the Face It Stage 3 final, where Luminosity had that amazing run through the tournament. They did even win a map off Fnatic, but Fnatic had the goods. And actually, it was Inferno was the deciding map there. So we saw Luminosity was in fantastic form when we saw them in the group stage. They were very, very impressive. Fnatic's had to work their way back in. Admittedly, they only lost to the team many consider the best in the world, if not them. So they did lose to an elite team. At the moment, it looks like both teams are going to be coming in good form. Yeah. And hey, listen, we said before, Luminosity's knocked off NIP, they've knocked off TSM, uh, they've knocked off Envious, obviously, then they knocked off Na'Vi yesterday. If they could add Fnatic to that, that's unreal. You literally beat like, the five or six best team in the world in a three tournament span. To give an indication that it's possible as well, they've beaten Fnatic twice in best of ones. The first time was at ESL Pro League, the first ESCA ESL Pro League, the first time around, the second one was at Cluj. So, actually, I, I might be mis... Was it TSM or was it Fnatic at ESL the first time around? It was Inferno both TSM times. TSM on Inferno. Yeah, it was TSM. Okay, so it was TSM the first CLG time. Okay, they've done it before. They've done it at a best Fnatic of one. CLG Pro sure. League yeah. back then. So. Yeah, but and also in that DreamHack run, the first game of the tournament for Luminosity was against Fnatic, and they got 16-0 Dust 2, and they've been banning it ever since mm -hmm. in their uh, in their veto process. So, yeah, it, it will be interesting definitely uh, tomorrow. We see that Luminosity already took the scalp of Navi, who they, and they had issues against Navi in the past. It, it is possible for them to do the same against Fnatic, even though Fnatic play well played well today and yesterday they managed to beat Titan and and and. Uh, TQM in the end, they're still not, I feel, at a level that they would like to be, you know, and maybe not even at the level they were when they won those three tournaments in a row. So there's definitely room for Luminosity to make an upset here, for sure. It also means more if you win in the playoffs. Like, because of the yes. format of this tournament, okay, it's cool to beat Na'Vi, but for all you know, kind of like what happened with Envious beating Fnatic in the ESL Pro League group stage, if you beat Na'Vi in the group stage here, but then you just go out and then Na'Vi, for example, goes on and wins the tournament, no one will remember that you beat them. They will in a way, but no one will care. If you beat Fnatic in the quarterfinals of a tournament like this, put them out before the top four. That'll be a huge story. This is that, that was kind of the, I word the, used the word inconsequential and was correctly called out for that because it wasn't an inconsequential game. It did have a seeding matter and obviously put Luminosity in the yeah. semis. But the one time that they beat Navi, it is the time that literally, it, it like you're saying, could be the one that's forgotten. It's yeah. not a playoff game. It's, it doesn't really affect the, the tournament too much in a way. Like obviously, you're going against an elite team either way. It doesn't really matter. To be honest, you've got to beat them at some point anyway to get further in the, to, to win the tournament. So I think those games, you kind of have to take the results with a little bit of a pinch of salt. But obviously taking them down was a, was like a demon off their shoulders almost. It's a, a, a scalp they haven't been able to take before, and now they've finally done it. So if anything, that makes them look stronger for tomorrow. One of the interesting things is like Fallen's actually statistically the best player of this tournament so far like in the maps he's played. He's in incredible form right now. So if he can show up like he has been uh, in the last couple of days, Fnatic could have a serious problem. But I'm kind of happy the fact that Olaf Meist is back. I feel a little bit more confident in them now after the first day. And by the way, Henry said they're a pinch of salt, Brazilian fans. I mean, I know you guys carry a whole yeah. like, sack <laughs> on your back at all times. Like, just a pinch, just yeah. a little twat. Oh, look at that. We've got, we've got Fallen the moment, the moment I mention him. Nice. And, yeah. and also he looks like he's being handcuffed there. <laughs> Off you go. You're playing too well, son. The old flush of treatment. Guardian probably handcuffed him because that, that was the big factor in that they finally beat Navi is he finally matched Guardian. Well, no, Gu Guardian's actually number two statistically as well. So like, those two are actually le like going at it right now. It's actually, that was like, one of the most in interesting matches. It was so much fun to watch that orb display. Like, two of the best orbs on the planet going at it. It was actually one of the most electrifying games I've seen in a while. All right, guys. Well, I think that pretty much covers everything. That's going to be a great game tomorrow. As mentioned, we'll bring that schedule back up. We do have a Dota game in between. Now, that is a best of three as well for Dota, which, as we know, can last... Uh, God knows, 30 minutes per game plus pick ban plus whatever, but roughly two hours time, about 1700 I think is when we're scheduled to start the next CSGO game, and it is going to be TSM versus Na'Vi. Thanks again to our sponsors G2A, EGB, The Score Esports, I've been using that app a lot. Unfortunately, it's not the one with the candle for uh, G2, but they'll probably add that feature at some point in time, as well as Twitch. 
and CSGO Fast Jackpot. We'll see you in just a little while, guys. Enjoy the donut. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.